It will happen, and it will happen in our lifetimes. Fusion power isn't just the future. Fusion power is now. T.M. Morgan Riley, Morgan Metagenics. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. So hello and welcome to the first, possibly only, Improbable Matter stream, a uh, live stream. I'm Val, uh, so I, I'm gonna go over uh, things you can see on the screen here. Uh, so I'll first go into much more detail. I'll try and be a lot more sort of, uh, you know, respectful, let's say, of the Helion, but I'll go into a lot more um, in detail about the Helion design and all their sort of properties. Um, I'll then go to, to NIF, um, and then, uh, you know, we'll see see if we get that far. I'll try and answer questions in the chat, uh, but, you know, be respectful and so on. Um, I also, now I've never actually heard a, uh, I've, I've never actually listened to a full uh, Joe Rogan show, but apparently, you know, his secret, I've heard of sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, I've heard parodies. Apparently, his secret is, you know, to have a, a, a buddy of mine. So I might have a buddy of mine come on in a moment. Uh, the that uh, quote that you saw before uh, was, you know, hopefully someone can uh, can find the uh, the source or someone knows the source. And if the audio is a bit low, yeah, I can raise the I can raise the audio here. Let's see if that will help. Yeah, it should help. Okay, well, maybe too loud. Okay then. So uh, let's uh, let's talk about um, Let's start talking about healing. Now, what I'll do is I will uh, I'll have a bunch of comments. Uh, so I'll frame my discussion around comments that I received or questions. Uh, and I've anonymized people. You know, that's, if you've had an insightful comment, that's great. I've anonymized uh, the comments just because uh, you know people uh, people haven't consented to it. So I, I have anonymized them. Um, so the first thing, the first quote there is I really li I really like it. It uh, says, "I'm all for criticism of popular ideas. If they're good ideas, they'll survive." Uh, that's uh, totally true, uh, you know. So, this uh, helium should easily, if it's a great idea, should easily survive any criticism I have. Um, now, the second one I also kind of like, but uh, <laughs> I really disagree with. So, uh, you know, it says, uh, "quote Have all the casual looks and reservations you like, but at least back up your claims with the math." In my field, plenty of armchair physicists claimed processes were impossible, only to be proven wrong when the engineers did the math. Do the math. Prove them wrong or be ignored. End quote. Now, th th this is uh, actually, you know, diametrically the opposite of, of uh, you know, correct in my opinion. Um, you know, the the burden of proof is not on me to disprove something or on anyone, right? As the sort of uh, debunker James Randi said, uh, let's imagine you wanted to disprove that uh, Santa's L, you know, Santa's reindeer could fly. Now you could take a reindeer to the top of a building and throw it off, all that would prove is that that reindeer cannot fly or didn't want to fly. Okay, so the burden of proof, I mean, just strictly, is on Helium to prove them, uh, them right. And if they do, that's great. Uh, and, you know, I'll be super happy if they have fusion energy uh, to be, look like a mug, uh, that's fine. But ultimately, the, the burden of proof is on them. Now, they're, you know, they're grown-ups. I'm sure they're not going to cry themselves to sleep at night because someone made a mean video about them. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, I have had comments like, oh, you know, you're, you'll damage their funding. I mean, if one video can damage their funding, then something else is wrong. You've got to ask yourself about that. Um, uh, and the final one, the final quote, I will read it out, uh, quote, I mean, you're just a idiotic 15-year-old. This is a group of America's brightest minds, and we will lead the world in fusion technology, end quote. Which I also like. I mean, uh, th that's great. Firstly, I have, you know, you can check. I, I, I don't I, I delete quotes generally. I've very rarely deleted any comments. You're entitled to have that. Um, the reason I bring this up is because, now, it may be true that I am a idiotic 15-year-old, 
But a lot of what I'm saying is, you know, quite literally textbook stuff. So I, you know, read textbooks. I read other sources as well, papers. Uh, I cite them. Um, I read several different textbooks, for example, and not just, to, you know, the content is the same. So we'll see in a moment, a, a, you know, a graph that I had. The content may be the same, but, you know, I look at also how to present that information. So hopefully, if they have uh, watched my, you know, How Fusion Works series, even Helion should agree, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, about how, how, why you need thermonuclear fusion. They, they do agree because they have, uh, they, in fact, they have the same curves that I had. Um, so, you know, yeah, it may, it, it may be the case I'm a idiotic 15-year-old, but you can go verify what I'm saying. I'm not saying anything that, you know, that I've come up with with a tinfoil hat in my uh, basement. I'm stating the textbook definition of, for example, why deuterium helium-3 fusion is hard. Okay, now, that doesn't mean, you know, the textbooks are correct. That doesn't mean that Helion can't, you know, sort of find an ingenious way or anyone else uh, can find an ingenious way to sort of overcome that. But what I'm presenting largely is, you know, scientific sort of, um, you know, orthodoxy, as it were. Okay. All right. Um, and hopefully someone is keeping, uh, uh, hopefully the buddy of mine is keeping a track of the um, the chat. I will try and answer good questions, especially super chats. Um, okay. Uh, buddy of mine, do you want to join now? Uh, and unmute yourself. And then I will also unmute you. So go, buddy of mine. No, I've lost buddy. Okay. And there's a stream delay. Never mind. We'll get you back. But OK, let me go on for now. Um, oh, no, 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 here we go. Um, oh, right. I think I pressed. OK, so I this which... buddy of mine, introduce yourself. Hi, um, um, I was there. Yeah, no. hey, buddy of Val. There you go. Right, excellent. OK, so uh, yep, uh, buddy of mine is physics background, not a plasma physicist, though. Uh, he's going to be watching chat to help me out. Uh, and yes, it's going to be, you know, um, like I say, it's a, it's better to sort of have a dialogue rather than just just me talking. So, okay. Um, so let I me will try and keep up. Right, yeah, great. Yeah. So, um, for, and, and another thing is, you know, I'm really in favor of errata. So here, um, I'm I'm showing an erratum. Um, so in in uh, in my first High Fusion Works video, um, not in the following graph. Uh, but on the, the the way you derive it, and I explain this is uh, from a, from the cross section, uh, and I, I give a diagram of the cross sections. And in in the uh, explanation, in the verbal explanation, I said that the you know the logarithmic scale changes by ten times every division. In for the for that particular one, it actually when I put the graph together, it actually changed by a hundred times. So. This is a totally correct, and I, all these errata I will like, so hopefully they'll come up um, higher in the, you know, so you can, you'll be able to read them. Um, so, yep, that, that, that was an error, but okay, let's go on. So what I'm going to talk about then, so I'll sort of go into more detail about what Helion, um, you know, claim and, uh, and what I sort of criticized them for. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he, the first thing I showed was a graph of the reactivity. So now, um, so for different reactions, uh, so this is in, uh, in units centimeters cubed uh, per second. Now you multiply that by the density in, let's say, centimeters in per centimeters cubed of reactant one times it by the density of reactant two. There you get your rate. If it's the same one, if it's DD, you have a factor of a half, which I mentioned, uh, but just by statistics. Um, but so what I said was that, uh, you know, objectively, the uh, firstly, the deuterium helium three reaction is much less reactive. Now, OK, just to just think, so we're on the same page. Uh, here's an analogy, right? Uh, taken, let's say, from uh, real engineering so should be familiar to them. Um, so let's imagine I gave you uh, some, you know, beaker full of uh, uh, high uh, sort of high um, reactivity uh, rocket fuel, you know, hydrogen, something like that. And then I gave you a beaker full of, you know, vegetable oil with the same amount of total energy. So if you burn it, you'll release the same number of energy, the same amount of energy. Okay, what's the difference? Can you run a rocket off the, of the vegetable? Well, no, because the vegetable oil reacts slower, it, 
it burns slower, releases energy slower, so the rocket will never get off the ground. So that's, you know, that's what we're talking about here. And um, as I mentioned, the deuterium-tritium um, uh, reactivity is much higher uh, than, than deuterium-deuterium or, or deuterium-helium-3. And this is not, you know, this isn't kind of some arbitrary thing. Um, this, you know, this really does work. So, for example, and I'll, I'll give a, a sort of more detailed uh, view of this. But, for example, when I was at, uh, working at the Joint European Taurus, Jet Tokamak, um, what they would do is they would run um, f f in deuterium, deuterium. So just full deuterium plasma in there. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, you know, they, they, they got it up to a certain temperature. I'll show you all this. And they, you know, they did experiments. And then they would later switch, you know, they'd switch out half that deuterium with tritium. Okay. Everything else the same. All the, you know, antennas, heating, beams, etc. all the same. But with deuterium, deuterium, and we calculated this, we, we could measure uh, the sort of energy being given out, which was, you know, is almost nothing, like kilowatts. Right. They did all the same stuff. But with deuterium, tritium, and bam, you know, tens of megawatts or what, you know, whatever their latest, right? So everything else the same. So this is practical. You know, this every every um, uh, machine should know this. And of course, um, the uh, the other important thing from a neutronics point of view, we'll go on to that in a moment, is that the deuterium, deuterium rate up to about 300 uh, million degrees Celsius dominates the deuterium helium three. So pretty much for every um, you know, for every helium atom that uh, reacts in a 50-50 mix, we'll come on to that as well in a moment, you'll get uh, one deuterium neutro uh, neutron if, if the rate is double the case, so, or, you know, at most half, or, or yeah, at least half, right? I explained uh, that. Sorry, explain that. Explain that again? Sorry. So, so, get... so okay, that, so firstly, okay, um, uh, this, yeah, so why is there a half in front of the deuterium deuterium rate? So uh, there's a kind yeah. of uh, logic, you know, this is a kind of uh, sort of almost probability problem. So let's say you have um, you have two particles meet. What's the probability the first particle is a deuterium? Uh, when which it, 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 when, and, and uh, what's the probability it's helium? Okay, yeah. Well, I'm asking you, what, what's the probability? I don't know. You got 50-50 mix of particles to, in a room. Okay, it's a 50-50 mix of, I don't know, Dota and Fortnite players, okay? Yeah. Two of them meet and collide. Basically, my point is this. What's the probability that they're the same, the, and the, the same, say, Dota player, or the same deuterium, or what's the probability that they're different? And the probability is, is double that they're different. So just statistically. I, I don't think, is that how that works? Okay. Yeah, with a 50-50 then. So with okay. a 50-50 mix. No, but okay, but that, I, surely, surely that's it's not as simple as that because one um, one atom's bigger than the other. No, no, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the cross, like that's what the cross section is about. So the, the, the okay. and, and the rate. That's why the reactivity is higher. But let's say that the I'm, I'm not saying what's the probability that they react. So that's to do with how big the atom is, as you say. But what's just the probability okay. that they bump into each other? So that's where the factor of two is there. Okay. I'm actually not watching chat. Is there anything super duper? I, I, I am trying to uh, to monitor chat as best I can. Okay. Um, I have c currently collected um, 12 questions. So oh, wow. That's, well, okay. We'll have to come back. Yeah. We may not be able to go through all of them. Oh, okay. Really. All right. So let, I'll better get on. All right. Whatever. So. That's that. Oh, I, I, I have one, one more question on this slide. Um, why have you stopped at a thousand million degrees? Excellent, good point. Degrees? So, so a billion. Um, well, the you know the records, the temperature records about for a for a fusion device or um, you know there are some experiments that go higher is uh, five hundred million. Okay, so the best you know the record right. Of any, yeah. of any, Tsar bomber, you know, biggest nuclear blast didn't go that high. Uh, you know, we'll see National Ignition Facility test, you know, proxy test for nuclear bombs don't go that high. Um, you okay. know. So it's just a, a practical uh, problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, we could yeah. keep going. And, you know, some people have suggested, but as a practical you, you matter, you know, come on. You know, and, and by the way, the other thing. So this is, I was going to answer this in a moment, but helium okay. themselves yeah. actually watched that, you know, it wasn't just the uh, real engineering stream. I'll, I'll reference some of their public uh, talks and videos, but in their <laughs> own th in their own uh, materials, they claim that. So firstly, the the Trenta, the current 
experiment was 100 million. So that's relevant here, yeah. And then mm -hmm. their next one is going to be 20 kV, uh, double that, so 200. OK. So and no, yeah. that's an excellent point. So we'll, we'll kind of, you know, we can talk about it. I had some good comments. Um, let me try actually draw it. Can I draw on the screen? Yeah. OK. And then that will undo. OK, great. Um, so, you know, so people said, well, OK, so let's say we want uh, the helium-3 deuterium to be high, let's just go to a, you know, a billion degrees. But that's not so easy. Oh, that actually seg segues me into another. Uh, um, I was meant to say on the last slide. So, you know, a lot of these fusion, and uh, you know, I'm, I hope I'm being fair here, but a lot of these fusion sort of, you know, uh, pitches, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is true of, of not just, you know, not just fusion, it's politicians as well, okay? You know, the way they say it is it's kind of like this. Like, now, okay, I'm, I'm a little more out of shape, a little more chubby than I used to be when I was young. You know, I'm not as athletic. Um, so, you know, and I know that in order to sort of, you know, get, uh, get slim and, and fit, I, I know I need to, you know, eat less, eat healthy, and, you know, exercise. That's just the science, right? I know the science. Mm -hmm. So this is my, this is, this is kind of what the pitch is like. Okay, um, I declare that I will, for the next month, uh, eat one single bowl of quinoa, a bowl of salad, and I'm going to hit the gym for three hours a day every day, and I will do that. Now, that's great. That's a great aspiration, okay? Yeah. This, right, you know, that's a great intention, um, you know, plan, whatever. But, uh, uh, you know, realistically, is that definitely going to happen? You know, I didn't just say it. I declared it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I did, uh, maybe maybe that's a little bit harsh. But, uh, but yeah. what I'm saying is, you know, that's, that's and this, this links back to what I said at the start. You know, the burden of proof is on, on the, these people. Now, great. If you go do it, that's fine. But don't say, oh, we will have it. Just, to, you know, you reckon you have it. Okay, great. Go do it. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't done it um, yet. I, that's, that's, that's fair enough. Um, I, I have, I have, I have a, a, a reasonable question uh, yeah, go on. To, to, to ask. Just as we're on this slide, yeah. um, why these four specific curves? A good point. Uh, so, well, firstly, the DT is the highest of all you know known fusion reactions. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, deuterium tritium. Yeah, the yeah. deuterium tritium is the highest. The uh, deuterium helium three and the deuterium deuterium and the next highest. Now the proton boron may not be strictly the highest next. It's quite high. I mean, you know, on this scale, um, like two two protons in the sun is like twenty five orders of magnitude or something below this. So you know, way way lower. Yeah. Um, to, you know, ten, one followed by twenty five zeros. Uh, the, the proton boron one is interesting because that is the only truly a neutronic one. This will start with the proton boron and it will create uh, three alpha particles. That's it. No neutrons whatsoever. You just run pure hydrogen, you know, the, the, like hydrogen one. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and just boron a plasma that's very technologically possible, and this is the only a neutronic one, and we might come back to that. But as you can see, w way the lowest, you, you know, uh, below. Yeah. So so let's say um, let's say helium wanted to do it, way still lower, you know, another two hundred times. Sure, and 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 realistically, we're only really talking about three hundred million degrees as like a practical application. We're not even talking of a billion degrees yet. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Yes, so, and you have you have other people in chat agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah. Now, uh, so good point. So yes, yes. So um, you know, the helium will not even reach what the temperature tokamaks reach, and they plan to use you know, given that their reaction is like uh, you know, so at, at their time, so it's at two hundred million. That's let's call it a hundred factor of a hundred times mm -hmm. lower. Right, then it talk like now, okay, that's fine, uh, because they can have higher densities in principle. We'll talk about that though. And again, there's a you know, will have versus you know, I declared it versus I didn't declare it or whatever, but um, factor there as well. Okay, um, so uh, now, yeah, so the first, the top comment here, um, is a good one. So that so it's fine to do um, uh, deuterium helium three. Let's say even that uh, Helion managed to do this, okay? So we'll look back at, uh, we'll look back at the, uh, at, at 200 million. Let's say they're getting um, a deuterium helium-3 going and it works fine. Um, 
the problem and uh, the problem then is okay that um, f the, uh, the, to make that helium three. So let's say let's say they're getting a minor energy gain. Of course, you know the reaction itself will give off energy, but there's going to be um, efficiency issues in the system. Not all of that is going to get uh, recaptured and so on, and they're going to they do need to put an input of energy. So they're getting some returns in electrical energy, and this is you know this is way better than any. Uh, fusion experiment has done so far, but let's say they're, they're, they, in their final power plant, they're getting more power out from the deuterium helium three reaction. The top comment is quite right. The uh, uh, no wait, that's not the top comment here. Um, so, uh, maybe this is wrong. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but the top comment anyway on this one is quite right. That um, you still you still need deuterium as the initial fuel. Okay, so because the, the effectively the process that helium is looking at is you're taking f three deuteriums at the start of it and you're making a, a helium four and either one proton and another one or one proton and a neutron, okay? Um, and so the point is, and, and the deuterium deuterium is less, like gives off less energy. So the problem is that even if they've got energy gain, you know, electrical energy gain on the uh, deuterium helium three part, which is what they, you know, they're super duper pushing. If they mm -hmm. then have a loss on the less energetically, um, you know, favorable deuterium deuterium on the first bit, then overall the process is not going to work, is it? So, so <laughs> that's another another factor which they haven't really addressed. You know, they're going, yeah, we're going to the the D three H E one is going to um, is going to work great. Um, but the uh, you know they they ha they're not talking about the D DD and with that one so we'll talk about how they plan to capture the energy back, um, uh, but with the DD as well uh, half the time it makes a neutron as we'll see and that neutron will leave and even by their own optimistic um, you know assessment um, even that that neutron is going to be gone you, you're going to need to you know boil water to to get the energy from that so the DD part. Even even with everything else working that they have have claimed, that DD bit at the start that must be done somewhere is go is going to bring the whole energy efficiency down even lower. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've, I've got I've got another question here for you. Um, when we're doing so in, in this DD reaction, um, we're producing helium. Three. Will we then react? Yeah, H three H three. Uh, will we then react again? So with the D uh, DHE yeah. reaction. So yeah. well, so this is, let's yeah we'll get onto that. So um, okay. So and, and um, now the other there's other two two other you know very good points here. Um, I actually I'll talk about the the the, the top one in a moment. Um, but this one. So what if you run with, let's say, 90 percent helium three and 10 percent deuterium? Well, OK, so I said that it's you know density of react reactant one times density of reactant two. That is going to bring down the the sort of reaction rate again versus a 50 50. If you have a 90 10, just think about that. You know, let's let's take that to the logical extreme. Let's say you have a 99.999 percent of one and like almost none of the other. Of course, the reaction rate is going to be much lower. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, again, that's just you know, statistically. So, if it, okay, great. If you have, if you have, um, you know, if you run it helium rich, um, then you're going to get even less energy. And now, going back to that previous comment, uh, okay, so you're you're now going to get less reactivity, uh, less uh, sort of you know energy out. That for, you know you still got to make the helium three. So you know again. Uh, that's uh, that's going to be um, yeah. So the, the the issue is that you're to a certain extent you actually can't necessarily just only create one reaction. You're going to be creating several reactions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, and I mentioned this in the video that you you know the the if you've got deuterium and helium three, you're going to have the deuterium re reacting. Um, sure. yeah, uh, now, so and I've put so. Uh, I've put the up top just as a as a memo here. So two deuteriums, you know, hydrogen two plus another hydrogen two, fifty roughly, or you know, almost exactly fifty percent of the time you get uh, a, a you know tritium. Fifty percent of the time you get a, a tritium and a, uh, a proton, and a fifty percent of the time you get. Um, 
a helium-3, which is what they want, and a neutron. That neutron leaves. It will not be captured by their, you know, electromagnetic capture, which I'll talk about, the adiabatic expansion, and so on. Now, this, so I had a comment there. Well, uh, the, the neutrons here, so there will be neutrons, and we talk about this big half, um, you know, this happens half the time again, so it'll be a quarter. Uh, I mentioned that in my reaction video. Um, but here's the interesting thing, okay, and I'm going to need, uh, I did try writing stuff, but I, I can't quite write with, um, you know, on the screen <laughs> with a mouse. So uh, for, for the writing, let's go to just a very cheapo uh, open office. So uh, let's imagine you have got, um, you begin, you've got a 50-50, oh no, you can have a 90-10, but the, the, the um, you know, it'll be similar sort of math. Um, so you've got a 50% D plus 50% uh, um, helium-3 mix at the start, at the start of your, uh, you know, the sort of compression and all the fancy stuff. <laughs> Sometime later, you now have, you've burned up some, and you now have 49% D, 49% uh, helium-3. Well, of course, uh, you actually would have, you know, maybe 49.5, let's call it, because remember, it's the... The, the, the deuterium gets depleted faster than the helium because the deuterium is reacting with itself as well. Plus then, okay, so in this case, uh, uh, in this case, 1.5% other. So let's say among that 1.5% other, we've got 0.5% uh, tritium. So we've got, compared to our fif uh, initial 50-50, we've got trace amounts. We've got one uh, hundredth here, the tritium, of you know, either of the two primary reactants. You're probably not seeing it. You're probably, if you're watching the stream, by the way. Yeah, you know, no, it's, it's fine. But I, you'll I'm, see, you'll yeah. see what I mean in a moment. So this is for, for the body of mine. Uh, for the rest of you, obviously seeing it. Uh, I am picturing it in my mind. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, the tritium here is one hundredth of the deuterium. So it's it's trace. It's nothing, right? Well, no, because because look yeah, here the, at, yeah, the, the, at the at the two hundred. Um, and 200 degrees C, the rate is 100 times higher. So yeah, a trace yeah, amount of the trace amount of tritium that gets made will react as with the deuterium as quickly as the 100 times more numerous uh, helium-3, as quickly. So for every helium-3 reaction then here, you'll get a deuterium-tritium. And that so the, the issue here was that um, the, the neutrons from deuterium, deuterium mm. have 2.45 MeV, and we'll talk about this. That's still f fast neutrons by nuclear reactor standards. But the claim here was, well, but it's still better than the 14 MeV. We'll talk, you know, we'll, we'll say this in a moment. But it's still better than the 14 MeV, um, uh, you know, DT neutron. Well, I've just showed... I've just showed you that with this, right, and again, you can do the math. So, um, yes, the, the density of tritium here is 100th, uh, it, it's 100 as high, um, but the, you know, uh, so the, the reactivity is 100 times higher. So, you now have, you know, the two to balance out. I mean, hopefully that's, that's yeah. clear. Yeah. And so, and so this all is happening within like the very, a microsecond of the of the of the transactions, basically. Yeah. You get it. Yeah. Sure. Now, okay. Now, all right. And 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 okay. But so, what you could say, for example, is, um, is like okay. But let's say they even have not as much. You know, let's say they have 0 0.005 tritium. Right. They hardly do any burn. Now, so I mentioned, for example, at um, you know, I mentioned that at Jet, for instance, and TFTR as well as the other tokamak that had uh, DT. Um, you know, they did they they did experiments in DD, and then you know sometime later I said okay they changed it over as if they did it straight away or a minute later or whatever. Um, they did DT. Now what they wanted to do was um, you know they they wanted to test the system with that the tritium would work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the uh, uh, they wanted to test like all their systems, you know, because it's radioactive and so on. Um, they wanted to test that their um, like tritium handling and so on would work, but they didn't yet want the DT, you know, neutrons and radiation and all that. So they wanted just T, right? 100% T 
in the in the vessel. That does still react. That does have a thermonuclear reaction, but it's much lower than DT. And so, you know, so what they what they okay. did, they finished their DD. They they pumped it down for the weekend at least, maybe in a few weeks while they did this. But even after weeks, okay, um, what you know, they, and this is pumped down to a vacuum, like better than space. Um, even after weeks, there was enough deuterium like stuck to the walls and so on um, that, uh, and uh, we'll see this, this is going to be a big problem in a moment, much bigger than it was at JET, but there was enough deuterium stuck to the walls that what they had to do was they had to run, um, uh, you know, they, they had to run just pure hydrogen to kind of pump it all out. So yeah. now for helium, they are going to be doing uh, like ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, in their reactor, they're going to be doing it at at least one hertz once a second, even 10 times a second. So they're going to be doing ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. They are not going to have time to properly vent the entire chamber of tritium gas. Yeah. Um, so, so they are going to have tritium... Well, like, well, could, so like if, if you can't vent it for, for, you know, with a weekend or whatever, you're not going to vent it in 0 0.1 seconds uh, fully. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. But, but how, how much tritium? Yeah. Like, so it, these it, are good it, questions. Because this, this is a small reactor, right? This isn't necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it's, like, about the, it's about the, the relative concentration. Sure, sure. So yeah. are they going to uh, vent everything? And we'll see why this problem is going to be. Um, yeah, okay. Well, we see why this problem is um, going to be even worse uh, in a moment. I have a, so, question. I have, yeah, I have a question from chat. Okay. Um, uh, the, um, or rather a statement, so uh, uh, let you have your thoughts on it. Uh, the tritium produced by the reaction is too hot and non-collisional on the time frame of the pulse. It's so it's, non, it's, it's non-collisional with electrons, but it's going to, um, so firstly, it still can collide with the, uh, you know, with the germ. Um, now, if it's completely non-collisional, uh, it's going to get, it's going to fly, and we'll talk about this, it's going to fly out to the walls, which is not going to be good, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so are all their uh, fusion products. Um, secondly, as I say, um, they're, they're just going to have, uh, you know, trace concentrations, but trace is enough because of the relative... Um, yeah. Uh, and thirdly, there's going to there's going to be one more thing that we'll come to in a moment. Why it's going to have. Uh, um, so I think I think I think when, when they say it's non collisional, they mean it's trapped in the uh, so, magnetic uh, field at the at the, the center center point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But. Um, OK. Yeah. Time. I mean, the gas is obviously colliding. So to answer the guy that is spamming now, uh, I mean, that's fine. For now, these are re relevant, though wrong. Um, they have special pumps for that. I mean, that, that sounds like an innuendo. So they have special pumps to vent the, the chamber completely, at going at 10 hertz faster than they have ever done before, or even 1 hertz, which is what they're plan planning to. The, like I say, proper pumps, cryo pumps, right, running for you know a weekend, you know, days, cannot vent a chamber, like just mathematically, right? You can, you can do, uh, you know, Monte Carlo calculations. They are not going to vent it after, uh, you know, one second fully. You are going to have, and there's one final reason we'll come on to why there will be tritium in that chamber in trace amounts. But as I've said, trace amounts in this case are the fly in the ointment, you know, shot of Bailey's or whatever. Isn't that a, a saying? You know? Okay, so, mm -hmm. so they will have uh, deuterium tritium reactions, okay, probably yeah. a, a, you know a, a significant amount, okay, certainly in the final. But, that, but to, be fair, to be fair, that still doesn't mean they can't produce energy, right? No, 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 so, no, no, no. So this is so this is a separate yeah. thing because because um, the point was that um, neutrons are bad, okay, and we'll come on to yeah, why yeah, they're yeah. bad. But they well, will produce they, neutrons. Firstly, they'll yeah. definitely produce DD neutrons, which I will show you are bad. <laughs> fast <laughs> neutrons by you know literally by the yeah. um definition in um you know in, in nuclear physics guys that work in fission yeah um they will produce fast neutrons um but they will also produce uh tritium neutrons yeah so um you know it, uh, if, if we just put this you know 
I don't know. Uh, somewhere, no, I won't say that actually. Uh, if, but if we, if we, if I'm, we by the way, I'm wondering: are, are people away. actually hearing? People are actually hearing you? Yeah, I mean, it's not. It, it, I, I, if if people can't hear deprival, the my buddy of mine, let just say that in chat. This this no, would have no. sounded very uh, schizophrenic. <laughs> I'm just pausing every stuff, and I hope they can. But yeah, it should um, be. Yeah, so I, hopefully, hopefully it's fine. I will, um, well, please say in chat if you can hear someone other than me as soon as you hear them. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's the same person. It's, it's, they're not using cryo pumps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. They can okay, hear. Okay, they can oh, hear. Lovely. Fine, Thank good. You. Right, you, perfect. Lovely. Otherwise, it's, it's... <laughs> yes. Um, All right, let's get uh, back so to it. Let's get back just, to it. If you just put it in a lead wall, in a, in a, okay, we'll region. get to lead walls. Let's uh, now. Is there anything okay, else? Well, we'll... Do, 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 do. Um, um, and I also, by the way, I also addressed from their own. So I'll give references, but by their own. Um, sort of estimates, they their future reactor, which is going to be hotter, which is, like I say, I declare that it's going to be hotter. You know, fine. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but li by literally, it is the burden of proof is on them to prove this. OK, mm -hmm. and we'll go on to why they may not be, you know, they may not get what they want later. Um, but so the future one is at t uh, 200 million by their own estimate. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that that's the, yeah. the all these issues are um yeah that's what they're aiming for so that's, yeah. that's the issues that they're gonna face yeah, yeah that makes okay. sense yeah i agree uh, yeah. Do, do, do. Uh, did I maybe I, uh, I, may, I may have missed up the order of these comments um but yeah but i think i addressed this so this was uh this is again could you run it um Helium-3 rich, like I say, that still has problems uh, in terms of, firstly, the reactivity is going to go down if you have uh, more helium than deuterium. Um, you're going to, as I say, have problems. You still need to do the deuterium-deuterium uh, reaction somewhere else. Uh, not so, like, with still not using so much electricity that the whole thing doesn't become, you know, unsustainable and so mm -hmm. on. Um, now radiation. So just I just again, just so we're on the same page. I want to get in, into about radiation. And the thing, you know, the the real takeaway is that um, radiation is really uh, sort of you know it goes up exponentially, the kind of thing. Uh, that is to say that um, you know there's certain things that uh, as, as this kind of XKCD shows here, there's certain things that, yeah, oh, you know, that's fine. That's fine. You know, you do a, get an x-ray, that's radiation. You know, you have a, um, there's lots of things that, you know, there's, there's other things that produce neutrons. But with this, it's like, like the amount of radioactivity can go up like, exponentially higher. So saying that, okay, uh, you know, hey, there's neutrons somewhere else. I mean, there's neutrons in my body now. There's just not as many of them. Um, yeah. Okay, anyway, that that is what I wanted to say here. Yeah. So, the, but what about at the at the energy levels that they're currently running at? Presumably, they're not producing significant neutrons, and therefore, it's not really a problem at at the stage six um, of the equipment that they're using. So um, I let you because I was reading chat. I let you finish before talking over you because we should not talk at the same time. That's a good point. Um, uh, so yeah, not right now, not very much. No, um, and so yeah, so. Uh, and we'll come on to my exact wording, I think, in exactly the next slide here. Mm -hmm. My exact wording. Now, people have been lawyering over this. Some, you know, most people, I think, understood what I said. OK, what I was saying is that, you know, in the real, and this is specifically addressing the real engineering video. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, now right now, I'm not going to attack them or whatever. But I'm just saying that the impression people might have got from the real engineering video is that the fu a future power plant reactor would look like a souped up version of, of you know, the Trenta machine, OK? Uh, and so, you know, so it just look like the same and there's no neutrons and blah, 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 and you can stand next to it and so on. What I was saying that if this machine, I'm not saying it did, but if this machine were running uh, at a reactor level, OK, of power, it would be giving off reactor levels of uh, radiation. So um, let me get back my um, my 
thing to type here. So uh, in fission, you have uh, you make roughly uh, um, about 180 uh, an MeV per reaction, and you release about 2.5 neutrons. Okay, so uh, with that, it's about uh, you know 72. Um, MeV per neutron. So it doesn't matter if you don't not familiar with what this is a unit of energy. If it, for 72 units of energy, they have one neutron in fission. Now, as I've shown you, you're going to get you know roughly a uh, one deuterium deuter in their scheme, one deuterium deuterium neutron, some deuterium tritium neutrons. So let's say that for every uh, total reaction, so they, they 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 have about 20 MeV. About you know don't again don't lawyer me. Uh, rough numbers here. They have about 20 MeV per, say, deuterium helium-3 reaction, but they have, as I hopefully convinced you, about one neutron. So this is a more, you know, the kind of ratio of uh, neutrons to energy is higher in fusion, even in he helium's fusion, than in a fission. So if the the reactor, as was implied, maybe you didn't get that implication, but based on my comments, a lot of people got the implication from the real engineering video specifically from that, not the, you know, I'm not even going to talk about the helium uh, materials themselves, but from specifically the real engineering video, you may have got, and some people did get the impression that this is what the reactor was going to be like. And what I'm saying is, if there's 50 megawatts in here, okay, then it's going to be like a uh, like a fission reactor, like inside the fission reactor, or if the walls had blown off it, like um, that f fission reactor, uh, like, like Chernobyl. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think chat, chat agrees, by the way. So okay. I think, we, I think, so, we, I think we have, you have explained it well. So that was my point. Now, there was some comments that, oh, of course, you, know, <laughs> you Wikipedia reader, well, uh, you know, fission, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, sorry, uh, the, the Chernobyl was a bad design, and blah, blah, and fusion could never explode. Now, here's just a little point, and, you know, it's, it's surmountable, but just a little point. So for uh, the tritium, okay, you know, if you're just storing tritium, it's or, or handling it, it's a gas, right? It's hydrogen gas chemically. So if you've got a lot of that stuff as gas form, you know, it's it is actually going to be explosive. And if that burns or leaks or explodes, it's going to be a disaster. So I'm sure oh, they're yeah, all... right. I'm sure I'm sure they will have that more than covered. And that's true for, but that's also true for any uh, nuclear fusion reactor. So yes, that's true, and we'll come on to that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so what I'm saying is they will have a larger f uh, flux than uh, many fission reactors. Now, why are neutrons bad? Let's talk. Uh, let's talk about why why neutrons are bad. Um, so I got two things to show here. So there's uh, there was an experiment, um, and what they did was they took now uh, uh, they, they took mirrors. Okay. You'll see this in a moment. Um, what they did was they took mirrors and they exposed them to neutrons. Okay, um, and so what happened after even a modest, uh, modest neutron exposure is the mirrors. You know, at first they were mirrors, right? Uh, after a certain while, uh, the mirrors went, and depending on the neutron flux, went dark. And now, um, okay. Actually, I'll rewind for a bit. I meant to say one more thing. So in my response to real engineering, one thing I touched on was what is, is technically known as activation. So this is where a, a certain nucleus, such as phosphorus in your DNA, will receive, will absorb a neutron, okay, uh, and it will it, it'll become radioactive. So then it's long lived. You know, once you switch the neutrons off, it'll still be radioactive. It'll be giving stuff off. It'll make things dangerous and so on. Um, that's one point, um, and uh, of course, and but once it once it does, you know, decay radioactively, it will be a different, potentially a different chemical element. So, with the phosphorus example, um, uh, uh, with with phosphorus example, it, it can be activated into sulfur, 
Um, and so that's a different chemical element. So, okay, now, you know, if, even if you've got sort of shielding for radiation, you don't care, you know, your sort of steel machine doesn't care about, you know, a bit of beta radiation or whatever. Um, the point is that you're changing the chemical nature of those, those uh, atoms. So, uh, you know, if you needed those atoms to be in a transistor, for example, okay, you know, that transistor could stop working. Now, another thing, so to be fair, um, not all materials can be activated. So for example, um, you're probably familiar with the regular, uh, with, with carbon-14 dating. So what you have is a carbon-12, okay? It can absorb a neutron and become carbon-13, which, and carbon-13 um, is not radioactive, so that's fine. So one, carbon-12 can absorb one neutron and it will not be radioactive. That's great. If it absorbs another one, though, now it's carbon-14, which is radioactive, which is, you know, how they date mummies or whatever. Um, so now let's so let's say you built your machine out of carbon. Now, there's good reasons you wouldn't want to do that. I'll, I might touch on them in a moment, um, it, but, but it'd be largely carbon-12. And so it would safely absorb one neutron. But let's say one in a hundred of those uh, carbon atoms absorbed and, you know, like you, d you had the machine and you ran it so long that eventually one in every hundred carbon atoms absorbed one neutron. Then statistically, one in every hundred squared, 10,000 would become carbon-14, would absorb two, you know, just by statistics. Um, yeah. So... Um, so, uh, you know, this, so even, even what's called low activation materials potentially can be activated, but I'm not going to, uh, so that, that was what I mentioned in the, um, strictly speaking in the, uh, response videos, uh, and another previous video, but that's, that's activation. But there is another, uh, another, um, point about neutrons, which is that, you know, even if they sort of don't, uh, let's say they, let's say that the carbon, uh, here absorbs a neutron, right? Um, and but so it's not activated. It's fine. Um, radiologically, it's fine. Okay, that neutron is carrying. Uh, if it's a, a DD neutron, that's uh, two point four MeV. If it's a DT neutron, it's fourteen. But it's carrying MeV um, amounts of energy. And an MeV, so compared to say a chemical reaction, that is you know a million times more. So what happens in um, you know, what happens when a new, one of these fast neutrons gets absorbed is that it knocks an atom so violently, that atom then knocks, you know, two more and two more and two more. You get this whole cascade. So one neutron coming in is going to, you know, it's like a shotgun blast into the, you know, if you have a, uh, if you have a lattice, right, most, uh, you know, you're familiar, hopefully, most um, sort of materials in a lattice, all atoms are sitting neatly, you're going badum shooting a, a big shotgun blast and you're moving those atoms around. And that, so forgetting the activation effects, that is what's happening here. You are getting, um, you know, the atoms in this mirror are getting knocked about by these neutrons. Um, and that's uh, uh, the, uh, that's what's causing the denaturing of these mirrors. Um, and the same thing happens to everything. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, those neutrons are going to make Swiss cheese, as I claimed in another video. Neutrons make Swiss cheese out of, um, you know, solid material, steel, whatever. And, and that, so what that does is it makes it more brittle. Now, in this experiment, for example, um, uh, at the highest neutron flux, um, it, it, it compacted the mirrors, you know, the physically, the material, uh, you know, changed so that it compacted by some amount. Um, uh, so, you know, so the, clearly that's a mechanical difference, right? If your steel becomes compacted or exp you know, contracts, expands, whatever, right, that's a big deal. And we'll come on to that a bit more in a second. Now, so firstly, um, note the numbers here. Uh, let's convert this to, so if you add four orders of magnitude, you'll make them into newtons per meter squared. That's going to be important in a moment. Um, and uh, now, what neutrons did they use? Um, did they use those big, bad uh, 14 MeV ones? Well, no, they used um, mostly thermal neutrons and some with energies greater than 0.1 MeV, which is so, you know, that's 1 20th, or like the, the, 
greater than one twentieth of the ones that, that even the DD ones, let alone 140 times the DT ones, okay, that I said that they are going to be. <clears throat> okay, so um, my point is that uh, now, okay, greater than, so probably some are 2 MeV, but even starting at 0.1 MeV, you're already um, you're already doing damage and um, you're, you know, creating um, things like voids and so on. Um, so now let me, I'm actually hopefully forgot to open another window. Let's do that to look up the, the other. Um, I'm going to go incognito Chrome here to look up the other source I was going to show you. Um, It's a website. It's uh, um, uh, it's a website by the I, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, um, and this so this is an experiment of um, and what they've done is they've put um, some material uh, into a fission reactor to study. No, oh, no, I do not want a newsletter. Um, they put some uh, some uh, sort of test materials to study this kind of uh, damage. Right, they they're going to use fission neutrons to study the uh, this kind of embrittlement uh, and uh, uh, you know and sort of basically neutron damage. Not forget the activation for a moment. Let's just look at the actual damage that this does. And so one of the uh, one of the problems there is that um, so the, you know as I said, these neutrons they strike an atom and they create big voids in the material. And what will happen is tritium. Helium-3 as well will get sequestered in these voids. And there will be like blisters. Um, actually, it, it sort of turns to foam. Um, now, uh, I'm actually the, the next in the next video in the How Fusion Works series. That's what I'm, I'm going into. But that's a, that's a really big topic. But my point is this. So, so tritium will be then sequestered in these blisters on the side of the um, you know, on the inside of the uh, the chamber in whatever fusion reactor you have, um, when this the inside of the chamber is embrittled, create uh, voids are created, and so on, um, tritium will be uh, will be adsorbed into there, and then it'll then you know gradually release again. So again, you're not going to pump this down magically. And by the way, so if it then gets adsorbed and and sort of captured in there. Um, what that will do then, because the tritium is intermediate level radioactive. Now, you know, yeah, if you leave that reactor for 100 years or whatever, most of that will decay away. But the, uh, you know, for the next like one year, right, it's going to be radioactive. I'll come on to the, why that's important. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a few questions in chat still about shielding and about. So, uh, and I'll let me come on to, we'll, yeah, let we'll, me come on to the come shield. Yeah. So, so hopefully, uh, you know, I'm not going to convince the super helium, you know, lovers uh, who think that there's a magic solution to everything. But this is a big problem. Now, oh, I, what I did say was I was going to uh, maybe I did say this or I certainly intended to say this was that I would be fair, you know, and I would say um, good news about uh, helium or you know, so sort of say positive things. So to be fair. These kind of experiments, they are being performed by the publicly funded, you know, by publicly funded agencies. So to be fair, what they learn from this, you know, Helion will be able to take that into account. They will, you know, low activation materials are being sort of researched for, you know, for general fusion applications. So fair enough, they would be able to use this. And, you know, if, if progress is made in kind of conventional DT fusion fields, Helion would be able to take this into account, to be fair to them. Um, but like I say, what they what they will have is they will have, if it's unshielded there, they will have the inside of their reactor um, be strongly bombarded by neutrons. It will denature the stuff. It will create voids. Um, you know, so it will absorb some tritium, making it uh, radioactive for a longer time. And of course, all of this is very bad for you know the actual functional. Uh, sort of, um, you know, the, the the function of those things. So if you have coils, and those coils now get turned into Swiss cheese, or have their size reduced, or swell, or whatever, all these sorts of things that happen from neutron bombardment, those coils are not going to function well. So they, you know, 
not a game changer maybe for getting uh, Fusion working initially, but if you want to make this commercial, you want those coils to last for years and years, okay, even from the, and as I've also shown you, even from the 2.45 MeV deuterium deuterium neutrons, you are going to start um, getting these sort of holes and so on. But will it be, it will be presumably less than a standard uh, tucker it will be less. So power. that's the next bit. I also that is actually oh, already a comment by someone Sorry. else. So this is from um, Helion's own, um, you know, materials. Again, I would not necessarily trust. Like I'd, I'd question it just generally. And why is this important? So what they think uh, is they they by their own again just you know, and I'm not being mean here, but uh, you know, just being a a. Um, a peer reviewer even, you know, I, I'm actually going to, I've got a peer review, I, I don't work in Fusion, but I still peer review Fusion articles. So just being fair and, you know, but but as a scientist, okay, uh, I, I would question their numbers, but let's take them for a moment. Um, what they're saying is 10, 10 to the 18 neutrons per second. Now, what we saw, um, if you remember, on the, the mirror study, for example, let's take taking that as a, taking the highest end of this, if we convert this, so um, this is with a, a, a sort of flux of 10 to the 24, adding 4 to f per meter squared. And let's say they have a 10 meters of surface area inside the machine. Uh, it won't be spread evenly, but let's say, let's say we're going for a total, um, you know, neutron exposure of uh, 10 to the um, 25 neutrons per uh, meter squared is what we would need. Um, they would go through that by their own estimates in a, just over a day. Okay, uh, whatever it is, 100,000 seconds, I think is about 86,000 seconds in a day. So in a day of full power, okay, they will go through that, that budget. So if they had mirrors, for example, if they need mirrors for diagnostics, which they talked about, those mirrors are going to go to this, you know, Okay, granted, these are dielectric mirrors, but things like fiber optics, uh, you know, control any sort of control electronics, that's what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. But, okay, and, and just to be clear, yeah, real engine, it, it, the, the, I think the issue that you're pointing at uh, is that, um, because obviously, uh, this is this is from uh, helium themselves, right? Yeah, um, the issue I think was that it wasn't particularly mentioned in. Uh, so, well, but let me let me go on. So what I'm saying, so forget even the real engineering. What I'm saying is, by their own um, estimate, the materials and forgetting even if you have magic zero activation materials, forget activation. By their own logic, uh, any materials is going to get so shredded, as shredded as those most shredded dark pitch black mirrors are going to be. Okay, after a day of operation at their estimated neutron outputs in a full reactor. Uh, by and as I say again, with this study with the mirrors was using it was not it wasn't just 14 MeV neutrons, it was using mostly thermal slum above 0.1 MeV. So lower energy even than the neutron ones. And as I say, they are gonna have 14 MeV ones from DT as well. For the reasons I outlined, again, not going to convince the super uh, super helium lovers here. The you know flag waving, you know helium people, but you know I've made a good argument, I think, and um, and it's it's again burden of proof is on them. So um, so and now, why? Okay, just on. just just to ask, yeah, okay, so. Obviously, this is producing neutrons, um, and you're going to have this neutron uh, issue. You ha obviously have the same problem in a tokamak. Um, we'll get and to. I don't, and I don't think anyone's. But I mean, I think that's. I think that's the sort of the main contentious point, is that this is producing less neutrons than a tokamak. Um, but it just. I think your point is, they will just need to have uh, sufficient shielding to avoid this problem. Is that is that not is that not what you're saying? Or, or have I misunderstood that? I'm waiting for you to finish, so I don't talk over you. Next, next point is an excellent point, a perfectly good point that anyone who watched my video should have, you know, spammed. You're an idiot. Why didn't you think of this? Well, why don't they put, 
you know, lead shielding or the thing that, you know, the, the walls of Chernobyl that didn't blow up around it, right? So so let's talk now. And so, so hopefully just to sum up the last bit, but using their own um, neutron fluxes with the lower energy DD neutrons, I have shown that the structural, you know, and the functional parts of their um, of their machine are going to get, you know, because of this neutron bombardment, they are going to get super denatured, as denatured as taking a mirror from a perfect mirror shine to pitch black. That's what I said. So what? So now let's look at the obvious what I'm going to call lead box scenario, right? So we're going to we're going to put this in a lead box. And to be fair to them. Um, a lot of this is because the real engineering didn't mention this. To be fair to Helion, they will have a lead box around the facility. Um, and this, what did it say? Yes, oh, before I go out, get on to that though, I would like to issue another erratum or clarification. Totally, you know, if someone actually points out something I'm wrong, totally behind this. So what I said in the, in the video, so I was quoting an earlier video, but what I said is that what you need is you need dense material to stop neutrons. And I can see how that would be misconstrued. So uh, I, I, as a plasma physicist, what I mean by dense material is like liquids or solids. Now, you know, you, we could, and we'll see, we'll see something that's like 10 times or 100 times more than even solid density, so extreme density. What I'm saying, by, what I mean by dense material is of that, not a plasma. You can't have a plasma that's going to shield neutrons. But as this commenter quietly, quite rightly points out, um, in the context, you know, what you might consider a dense material is like lead or something that's heavy. And actually, you can have, you know, heavy water, you can have paraffin, whatever other people have suggested. So, yes. The, the, what I meant by dense was relative to the the plasma, even in, in Helion's higher plasma than tokamaks. Uh, but dense, I mean, as in you have to structurally have something. If you want water, you can't have water just filling in the Helion machine, of course. You'd have to have it in a, because the, there's a vacuum in there. So you'd have to have some sort of container for that water. So water, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, and you need, so what you need is about, I, I claimed about a meter, okay, even say say half a meter. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking about not just not just a little bit, right? For the kind of fluxes we're talking about here, you would need, um, you know, you would need a, a batter, like of order a meter um, stuff. So let's talk about, uh, for firstly, hopefully that, um, that erratum, hopefully everyone understood. Let's talk about the lead box scenario. This is a, a you know, this is one of their own um, sort of uh, pictures. So let's imagine this is their, again, this is not really their total working reactor, but let's imagine it is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put a uh, lead box around this. Great. That's a great idea. Um, and of course, it will stop. Um, so, you know, uh, It'll stop the, the radiation. Everyone will be safe. Uh, as someone said, you know, the helium team will be perfectly fine and healthy if they don't go inside this, if there's a box. And, you know, to be clear, I love, you know, I, I, I want fusion power to work. I like fission power. I, I want, you know, I, I'm very happy with it. It's safe. You know, the people in Chernobyl were idiots. I'm sure helium will be safe, by the way, with the tritium. But that was just, you know, just so you know, um, that, that comment about that. So. I, you know, I'm happy with having, as long as it's well protected and regulated, I'm happy with uh, with having a, um, you know, as long as it's in a box, uh, something that's radioactive. No problem with that. The problem here, well, firstly, that's that's me. Not everyone is going to like that. That is already, and this is true of all fusion, of course. Um, and, and you know, now some of you are saying, well, of course, everyone knows that uh, fusion is radioactive. I literally had a commenter. Now, on my very first fusion video, I started by saying that, you know, well, it's radioactive, whatever. He said, um, you know, I, I switched this off one minute in because you said fusion was radioactive. There is no radiation in fusion. So, you know, now we, we let's agree. So the guy that's spamming and, hate, you know, is correcting everything. I say, hopefully we can agree that there is, you know, <laughs> there is radiation diffusion and that, that that other commenter was wrong. Right. Um, so, you know, but my point is that the general public, you know, th they, they don't necessarily know this. And so they're not going to be happy that there is, in principle, um, uh, you know, that there is radioactive material inside. So there's going to be some political issues. OK. And, but, you know, if Helion, if everything else works for Helion, I'll be the first to sort of champion them. And I'll say, no, no, look, 
you know, when some sort of, you know, uh, the German Green Party, for example, who are against nuclear power, even though it's actually bad, you know, it's actually better for the environment than than being positive. This will, in principle, you know, will stop radiation and it will be perfectly safe and fine. The problem with this box idea around the, you know, around the building, whatever, is that it will not stop the neutrons from activating or embrittling, as I, by the two processes that I talked about, uh, will not stop them from activating or embrittling the um, the machine itself, which will be bad economically, because if the embrittlement breaks the machine after a year, that's going to be bad. The activation is going to be bad. And one other thing, you know, it's kind of you, you wouldn't think this, you know, if you if you're just designing stuff on paper, you wouldn't think this. But let's imagine something broke. OK, and there's tritium in this machine. Right. You want to go in there and you want to, you know, it's just a water cable, right? Came loose, whatever. Right. OK, they'll have great cables, let's say, but something will break and you'll want to go in there and fix it. So if this tritiated now, again, long term, that's fine. After 100 years, it'll be perfectly safe. But to go in there on the day, you know, you don't want to be waiting 100 years to go in and fix this. So having this, you know, external box idea, OK, is bad. Now, Again, to be um, fair to helium, this is, of course, you know, some of this is a problem in the rest of fusion, and they're developing, you know, things like robots or whatever to go deal with it. So helium, if everything else works for them, they can, you know, borrow robots, whatever. But this is this is one other problem for them. Now, so so, and I and, and but but the the key one here is that um, that the neutron flux, unless it's shielded, will denature the machine in a technological sense, the coils, the, uh, you know, uh, relays, whatever, transistors, optics are going to get, uh, you know, churned up by, um, uh, I, I, uh, they're going to get churned up by neutrons. And it's going to make, you know, initially, the machine's going to work great if it works. But after a while, it's going to um, just stop working, you know, when, or, uh, and or, remember, um, We'll kind of come on to this, but you know, helium requires everything to be super duper spick and span, okay, um, for, for everything to work. You get one of the coils slightly off, it's gonna, you know, that the plasma physics is not gonna work out, okay. Oh, so can now, you, can you, put, oh, sorry, yeah, go on, hit me. Can you put the shielding inside the chamber? Perfect, I, I, the obvious question. We did not agree, you know, we, we did talk about this beforehand, but that is my next point. So the second option is shielding like this. I mean, okay, uh, bad drawing, whatever. But what I'm saying is, let's shield inside it. Um, and so that'll get rid of a lot of these problems. Fine. Fantastic. Here's now, here's admittedly a simple explanation, but the, but here's why that's going to be a problem again. Um, but besides things like they, they'll need optics and so on. Here's the problem. What that means, as I said, is you need, let's say, a meter of material. So you're going to need to basically make move the coils one meter further out, especially in this in the middle bit where the pla you know, their plan is to have the plasma compress. Yeah, it's big over here. But I mean, just look at their website. It basically looks like this, right? So th yeah, it's big out here. Maybe that'll work. But here, it has to be very tight, fields have to be large, and the coils have to be very close physically to the, um, uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, well, to the plasma effectively, yeah? Um, and that's the kind of plans they'll have in the immediate time before, you know, before all these, before proper, um, oops, oh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so that's their plan. So why is that going to be a problem to put a meter more shielding in there? Just as a simple now, you know, we can go into more detail. But as a simple thing, this is, you know, high school level physics. If you have a coil with a current, right, and you want a target magnetic field, magnetic field given by current, you know, some constant current over over the radius, you uh, that, that is the, the radius of this coil, you go from there sub one meter coils to now, you know, over a meter coils, right? Now the B for a given current is going to drop. So you might say to me, fine, well, we'll, we'll up the current, let's say, so this is get the same magnetic field from a larger coil. <clears throat> Remember, we want the coil to be larger just to re uh, recap, because we're now going to have shielding between the coil and the plasma, which, you know, they obviously have some but not not a meter of it, which um, 
And for the meter figure, you can look in the other reference version. Um, but so, so now the B field is going to go lower, okay, um, for a given current. Now, okay, you can pump up the current, fine. But then you have, you know, now you've got a big magnetic field. Uh, it's a, so that's the, that's the magnetic field on axis in the middle. Uh, you pump up the current, and the magnetic field here will go up at the actual coil. So now you're putting more stress on the machine. Can you really handle those currents? Even superconductors have a you know limiting current that you can have, and so on and so forth. So the the kind of shielding in between the plasma and coil approach, or in between the plasma and other electronics approach, also has its problems, which are not you know they just don't have. Uh, you know, they, they certainly they haven't presented, um, uh, you know, solutions to this, and it's it's again questionable how exactly that's all going to work. I think that's fair. Yeah, I agree. So, so, so what I'm saying is, you know, no matter what you put, it's got to be about a meter, and if you put a meter in into their current design. Right, something like, the, well, you know, yeah, here, this one, right? If you put a meter in here, and it's got to be everywhere. So if you put another meet, an extra meter here, you know, and this is currently like, uh, you know, this is currently less than a meter, so you're more than doubling their size, tripling even. Um, is, is all their other stuff going to work? Now, uh, you know, and another thing, so, okay, so let's say in principle it could work. That's fine, um, but the, the other issue here, of course, you know, it'll take them, it's not going to, it's not going to just, you know, Overnight, they put in bigger coils. It's all fine, right? It's going to take them time to then, uh, uh, to then retest this to to make it all work and so on. So that's even more on top of what they already have. So again, it's so it, they can overcome this. Now, uh, yeah, I forgot to say this in the maybe I did in the very beginning, but just maybe if you've rejoined us, you know, what I said was the burden of proof is on these guys to show that this can work. What I've presented is, you know, kind of the scientific orthodoxy. If you open up a textbook, it says, you know, this is why deuterium helium three is hard. So, you know, if they, if they, um, if they do show that this all works and works brilliantly, you know, bully for them, great. Because, you know, all I'm saying, all this nonsense that I'm talking now in that case, that's just problems that they'll overcome. That's, you know, yeah, um, they'll start, they'll, they'll, they'll put in a meter of shielding and they'll still work and it'll still be brilliant. Good for them. That's a huge challenge that they'll overcome. But like I say, that is a challenge. Um, you know, they can't deny it and they don't currently have plans for this sort of thing. So... Um, I've, I've, I've at least motivated, I've ran a number, at least basic numbers there on why that's a problem. Now, the other fair point is, uh, oops. Um, the other fair point here, well, firstly, I, for this comment, um, says that, you know, they'll have Polaris, the next device will have higher temperatures. I've talked about that. But this comment, um, you know, what, what they say is, well, uh, Quote, the section about neutrons applies literally to all fusion reactors. The difference with helium is that they will produce uh, much less neutrons with far lower energy levels, end quote. So, uh, okay, now we, you know, again, I'm, we've talked about how many and what energy levels, why they still will have 14 MeV neutrons, and the fact that even uh, 2.45 MeV neutrons still uh, embrittle and damage the machine. But let's talk about this. The, this section applies to literally all fusion reactors. Right, that again, wearing my burden of proof hat, that, you know, maybe all fusion reactors are doomed to fail. You know, this isn't proof that helium will work. But I, I, will, I will take this as a, you know, this criticism of all other fusion reactors. However, um, the difference with tokamaks is that they you know, have proven that they, you know, they're this one meter of shielding that I talked about how it's going to be hard to squeeze it in amongst the coils, that one meter of shielding for any serious tokamak design now, uh, you know, serious DT future uh, plant design, for any serious one, that's baked in. So here's a proposal, not even, by the way, for a power reactor, about it. it's just it's this paper, which I really like. Um, you know, it's, it's a good paper, you should read it anyway. Right, it talks about why you need, for example, a meter to, uh, of, of material to stop uh, neutrons, things like that. It's very good. Um, so this talks about a spherical tokamak. So, you know, the plasma is going to be, you know, it's like a sphere pierced in the middle by a column. And th th now, if you look at the scale and all that, this blanket here that they have designed um, 
is going to be a meter. So it uh, uh, and the coils, that's these guys here, are going to be behind that blanket. Any decent, you know, and of course now, if you know, if you get a suggestion here, I'm going to have a tokamak and I'm going to have a teeny weeny uh, little wall. Forget it. But any serious, credible design for a tokamak or other uh, DT machine must have a thick blanket. And the credible ones that do exist do have such a thing. Now, again, I will, you know, uh, sort of credit is what credit, what's the opposite of, what, what's the flip side to credit is what credit is due? The, the flip, you know, whatever. My point, the criticism, let's say. My criticism, so I actually don't believe in, like, I don't think spherical tokamaks will work either. Because the, with the spherical tokamak, you have to make this central column so thin that and this is by you know in this paper they make you know lots of apologia for it that you cannot act adequately armor this bit and so these guys these coils are not going to be protected and I think this is a dead idea you know even if all the plasma physics works I don't I personally don't think that this uh, the ST has legs now for a conventional act uh, aspect ratio talk Mac you're going to be talking about the plasma here. Um, uh, I can actually probably say, yeah. You're going to be talking about a plasma cross section that looks like this. And now you're going to have enough room here to put the coils and the, you know, you, you're going to have room to put uh, shielding and a big fat coil, right, between it and the plasma. So you're going to, so for a, good, for a conventional aspect ratio, Tokamak, you, ha you have enough room and, you know, you can look at the designs, like the, all this business with the coil that I talked about, you know, all that's baked in. So, yes, the field is, for example, in, in, in say, uh, my, uh, I'm biased, um, but in MIT, uh, MIT's um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, that's my, f I, I still think they have a mountain to climb, but that's my favorite um, and that of, of the startups. That's my favorite one. Not saying they're definitely going to succeed, you know, Again, probably not, or probably they'll have trouble. But if you look at them, so they, they're talking about, you know, let's say 27 Tesla on coil. Uh, um, uh, let me go. Um, just just with the basic, um, just with the basic, you know, like just magnetic field of a coil. Um, they're going to have 28 Tesla on coil and then, you know, 8 Tesla, whatever it is, 6 Tesla, whatever, in the middle. But all that's baked in. They, from the outset, are designing their machines to have shielding. Even, even forgetting the DT bit, just from the point of view of, um, uh, you know, of, of the embrittlement issue. So now they've got a meter of room there to stop, um, you know, to stop neutrons before they, uh, before they hit anything critical. And then that, that blanket that they're going to have, yeah, it's going to, you know, it, and that's a big question. Is it going to survive? You know, it must do. Right. So if it doesn't, fair enough, then, then no tokamak will work. Fair enough. But for that same reason, nor will uh, helium. And just on the on the thermal blank on the blanket that's, yep. that's catching the neutrons, it, is that also warming up and then used to power the steam engine? Well, steam engine, but, you know, the power plant itself. Or is that is that a, a separate step? No, no, that's correct. So the, the blanket, again, this is a absolutely must work for a tokamak design. And if it doesn't, you know, then then the tokamak is finished, you know, etc. But so, yes, a blanket will firstly breed the tritium and secondly, um, you know, take the heat and uh, pass it to a out to a, a power plant, uh, you know, to a, uh, yes, a, t a turbine. Oh, and that's ITER, right? That, that well, ITER will have tests. It won't have a full blanket, but like a proper reactor will have it. Will have to have it. Okay. And um, is is the point that will these blankets? Um, how long will they survive? Or is, is is the point they need to survive long enough that they produce enough energy to create the blanket? Is it is it like a, this blanket is going to be, you know, disposable effectively? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, these are excellent questions that the, these guys need to answer. You know, ask. I mean, yeah. So again, Commonwealth Fusion, MIT, um, 
uh, and if, uh, by the way, the, their program was originally they wanted it to be publicly funded. Um, you, so they, from the outset, uh, are designing it to, so that you can you can swap it out, for example. Now it's very hard to swap things out because you have coils inside of other coils, kind of thing with the tokamak. So you know th they, that's another big thing of like how can you actually maintain it. So they are thinking from the outset about mm -hmm. how they're going to get in and change stuff. What if helium needs if for their full final power plant? What if helium needs to swap a coil out? You know how easy is that going to be? Yeah. Um, so, you know, probably they have, they have answers, but, um, uh, you know, with the embrittlement issue, potentially quite hard, which they haven't addressed. Uh, OK. I so have one more question. Go on. Hit. Is this from chat, by um, the way, or is this just this is This is, well, slightly related to chat. <laughs> People have started talking about thorium, so they're talking about fission. Um, but obviously, a related question would be um, in fission reactions, um, I believe, we're producing neutrons. Uh, is is there learnings from there that that can be applied to fusion reactions? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, yeah, low activations. I mean, as I said, there was uh, I showed an exact. Um, um, I, sh I showed an actual study, right, where they're they're putting stuff into a fission reactor, but also just generally, you know, the basically nuclear engineering aspects that you know, the, these guys have to deal with. They're, fortunately, they can pour in heavy water or whatever and ha put graphite rods, which you can't do. You can't pour the water in, inside the helium machine. Right, right? You, you did say, yeah. It was the water. Was, uh, yeah, I, I can only apologize. Yeah. So, but are there lessons to be learned? Yeah. Uh, there are lessons to be learned. There are lessons being learned. And again, to be fair to helium energy specifically, they will, I'm sure, and they're not stupid, could potentially, you know, would even learn these lessons and be able to run with some of this stuff. But it's just, you know, just the numbers don't work out. They're still going to have, you know, they're just going to have too much embrittlement um, without shielding. Um, now, <clears throat> so um, now let me, uh, well, let me quiet my, uh, how's this going to work? Let me just take a sip of water here, or sip of something. You can talk. Hey, hey, ask me a question while I uh, take a sip. Okay. Uh, I know we should probably have done this question at the very beginning, um, but what is your previous occupation or research area and institute? I'm curious what you've worked on since you mentioned you were in fusion research. As but, we're in the middle, we should start with that. There you go. Perfect segue. Here's some a picture and some data that I um, nicked, for, frankly. I mean, I have from when I was uh, doing a, a postdoc uh, based at JET, the Joint European Taurus in the UK. Um, so uh, let me first explain. So is a tokamak. Um, uh, so picture on the left. Uh, we're seeing this is like a still from a movie. I in, uh, included uh, part of this movie in a couple of my videos. Um, this is a still from a movie filming what's happening inside Jet. Okay. Now, firstly, what are you seeing? The, so it, the, the plasma is filling in here. Okay. And the, the kind of shape of the plasma is kind of like this. What you're seeing, though, the light that's given off is given off. Um, from uh, where the pla so firstly, if, it, if you just had gas, right, uh, gas at, at sort of room temperature, it's not going to give off light. Um, and but also the very hot plasma doesn't give off much visible light. So the visible light you're seeing here um, is uh, 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 is from the um, specifically the plasma that is a kind of not too hot, Maybe something like uh, you know thousands of degrees. Basically, the plasma that is recombining back into a gas. Now I'm simplifying. If you know atomic physics, you'll know more. You know, I don't need to tell you. But basically, uh, the plasma that's recombining back into a gas. So it's around the edge and at the bottom is where most of the that recombination back into a gas happens. That's what you're seeing there. And what I'm showing. And, and okay, so now. Um, so it's a big. This is like half the torus, and then it goes all the way around, right? Um, and the middle is somewhere to the left here. Okay, um, it's about, so for so, so the middle, the actual axis of the torus is about uh, to the left here, and the middle of this plasma is about three meters away from that axis of the torus. So, um, so, and I'm showing here now. 
distance, that distance from that axis in meters. Um, so going outwards like this. So one of the things that I criticized Helion about, and I will criticize them about this now, is their diagnostics. So this is how do we really know what the temperature of their plasma is, or anyone's plasma. And so um, let me just uh, sort of give a bit of fusion history. So um, what these, what a lot of these, um, you know, private companies are doing is basically speed running the history of fusion itself, where what they wanted to do, what the publicly funded institutions wanted to do is, at first is like, okay, right, let's build a machine, let's get some coils, let's do this, let's have it get a plasma. And then they tried it and it didn't quite work, or they got pretty promising results, they actually thought they'd cracked it. Uh, with a machine like Zeta, they thought, yeah, we've got it, it's done, done deal, the Daily Mail published an article about it, uh, you know, in the 50s. Um, uh, but what they then found out is actually they were a bit premature, and they, you know, they actually had not cracked it. So what they started doing was adding um, diagnostics, so ways to measure the temperature, density, other properties of a plasma. So that now a typical machine like Jet is big, but the diagnostics are probably just as big again. So you know the. Um, and I'll show you one of the diagnostics. It's probably about as big as Trent's machine, and it's you know it's it's of the order the size of Jet itself. Now not as dense as you know optical tables and things, but still really big. And and again, I could see that just from Real Engineering's video that they just do not have the high um, sort of high quality large diagnostics. These are things you cannot sort of cheap out on. It's not like oh you know hey um, these. These big, you know, lame, bloated institutions, uh, like uh, public institutions, are, just aren't as lean and, and cool as our uh, startups, right? You cannot. Achieve, this is like a fundamental, you know, physical thing. You just need it a, a certain size, right? So one of the diagnostics here, um, uh, what it is, it's um, what they do is they shine a laser through the middle of the jet plasma. Well, done this terribly, haven't I? Uh, yeah. I'll draw it. So they shine a laser beam through the middle of jet. And then that laser beam gets scattered by the, uh, by the plasma inside. And what they'll have above is they'll have, this is called uh, Thompson scattering, high resolution Thompson scattering. Um, that's the blue line here. So the, the temperature that's measured by it is the blue line, if you're wondering on the, um, on the plot. So what happens, the laser beam comes in, and then they'll have some detector, and it's collimated. So um, so, uh, and the laser beam will get scattered, uh, let's say some of it gets scattered upwards, so it goes up, uh, and it goes to some detector. And, uh, and because of this collimation, only the rays that are coming vertically upwards will get to the detector. So a ray, so firstly, the laser light is along a line, right? It can't be anywhere else, the laser's a perfect beam. And secondly, any light that's kind of scattered like this will hit the side, it won't go to the detector. So this detector, if you get some laser light in here, you know that the laser light came along this path and uh, scattered from exactly this point. So this, you know, hypothetical detector is measuring, and it the, it gets the density and temperature of electrons, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the density and temperatures of electrons, and you know, you know, it must be from here, and it's you know, it's calibrated really well, and so on. So that's the blue. And this whole system with the laser, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, like I say, is, is like probably bigger than Trent or whatever, the, the Helion's machine. Um, and now, um, and so, so we've got a bunch of different diagnostics on here. So another one for electrons is the, so that was the blue uh, high resolution Thomson scattering. Uh, LIDAR is another one for the electrons. And all of these points, um, they're actually just two. So the CX uh, char uh, charge exchange, these are, you know, this, they're different points, but from effectively the same diagnostic. And then there's the X ray crystal uh, spectrometer. So all the points are for ion temperatures specifically. So the, the temperatures specifically of the ions, which even in Helium's machine, but in general in plasmas, do not need to be the same as the electron temperature. They can be high. I'll show you an example. Um, uh, so, uh, but my point is this. My point is that this is extremely well localized and well known. Every, you know, they, they know the exact, um, you know, temperature at, at, at the very precise locations. And in this case, you know, they all pretty much agree, though not 100%, different disagreements. Now, why is this kind of thing important? Um, so I've, I've 
kind of drawn the edge of the plasma here with the dashed line uh, and what I deduced it to be um, at the time, let's say. But let's imagine, so at this edge, that you had a perfect, uh, some sort of like perfect force field, you know, Klingon force field that's magic that stops all heat and particles from leaving. So a perfect sort of barrier. What that what would happen? Well, there's a bit of um, this is one of those you know deuterium only. So there's a bit of deuterium fusion going on here. So if 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 no heat energy could leave past this line, what would happen is that the heat would build up and the temperature would go to infinity and you know eventually like uh, the the deuterium deuterium rate would go up at least for initially, right? But the temperature would go higher, and of course that's not the case. In reality, some uh, you know, uh, some heat is being lost. It's being lost down the gradient. Now, actually, let me, uh, I was meaning to do this earlier, um, but just, uh, this is a more broad point. So when we talk about um, helium having, and you know, and this is not them saying this, I'll, I'll just, this is me clarifying that they, they say the same thing as me. Uh, maybe let me go back somewhere uh, where I can just draw. Okay, I'll draw here. So I'm gonna call this the oven principle Okay, so let's imagine you've got your, you know, standard oven in your kitchen. Okay, uh, these, let's say these are the walls here. Um, and you've got your pie or whatever in the middle. What does the temperature here look like? So I'm going to draw, you know, position and temperature. The temperature, so outside the oven, you've got room temperature, so low temperature. And inside, the te so the inside you've got a high temperature low again out here, and in between you have it like this. So you've got a high temperature in the middle, um, uh, and and a basically a temperature gradient here, and so the, what the walls are doing is they're stopping the heat going out, so the, the outside's cold, the inside's hot, and the the, um, the walls are stopping getting out, but some heat is flowing down this gradient, some heat is going out from your pie out to the to the rest of the room. So when we talk about a temperature, and, and you know, to be clear, Helian, if you go into their technical talks, you know, mention this as well. But what we're talking about is, you know, maybe the temperature in the middle, or for Helian, it's more like this. Um, so if I draw the same kind of curve for Helian, to be fair, it is more like this. Um, so it's you know two bumps or whatever. Um, but but so that's what I'm talking about, right? And so so what determines um, how sort of peak uh, how much how much it peaks is the conductivity, how much the uh, how how quickly the heat is conducted out, you know, and the power and so on go into. It. But the conductivity is what's important. If you if you're conducting the heat quickly, it'll go from from this high one down to this low one quickly. Now, with this very very sort of high you know uh, high resolution. Um, Data that the people at Tokamax can can get the conductivity of uh, you know the heat conductivity very uh, accurately, but helion does not have uh, really good diagnostics. Now, uh, firstly, actually, let me show you. So this is at some time later. So the other thing is that um, you know the, the, that laser I was talking about and all these other ones they're working every so uh, they they can redo that. They can take another measurement every you know some number of milliseconds. So they know the, the conditions in the plasma, you know, every 10 milliseconds, whatever it is. Here it is at a time later. Now, I'll, um, what I've got up here is, so the, the, there is beam power, if, you, if you're if familiar with, you know, general fusion devices, there is beam power, hardly any um, radio heating though, so beam heating, but no radio heating here. Um, and at this time later, we now have, whoops, we now have um, more, radio heating um, power. And so what that's done is it's raised the, the ions. Remember, these circles here are ions. It's raised the ions above, slightly above what kind of helium, helium have um, on this scale, 9 kV, they report maybe 10. So it has raised the ion uh, temperature here uh, on jet above the electron temperature, just like helium are claiming, so that's possible. Um, but my point is that they have really good time and spatially resolved diagnostics. On any modern um, fusion reactor, they'll, uh, they'll have those. Um, whereas helium don't really have um, particularly good diagnostics. Um, sorry to say, they, they have, um, and they ha um, and uh, well, so what they have is, um, just visible Bremsstrahlung, so that'll be line integrated. That means you know you're just looking at light. So if you're if you're looking right, you have um, you know some right an eye. 
um, you know, electronic eye, obviously. But if you're looking along the line of sight, you're going to be seeing, uh, and they're looking at the, the Bremsstrahlung that's given off, you're going to be seeing some in the middle, some uh, on the edge or whatever. It's just nowhere near as accurate. Um, and a lot of what they do is, and, and the time as well, this sort of, uh, you know, how frequently can they see is pretty bad. And, and of course, with Helion, it's a very fast... Right, it happens in uh, in milliseconds compared to jet, which is quite stable over you know tens of millisecond scale. So they, what they do a lot for their diagnostics, even by their own admission, is they do a lot of extrapolation. They are not measuring in many cases the the temperatures that they claim directly, like they do on jet. This is as direct as you can get. You know, you I, I explained how laser is scattered from one particular place, um, and you know it's coming from there and you know what time it's coming at and so on. Helion don't have that. They have to extrapolate using their, you know, they, they sort of measure at the start, let's say, and then they have ideal scaling laws, um, adiabatic scaling laws. I'll probably talk more about that in a moment. Um, to just kind of extrapolate what their uh, densities and temperatures are, which isn't great. You know, that's not, that's not measurement. And so I, I, I'm very skeptical about, you know, some of what they say just because the diagnostics, you know, you're not measuring it, you're, you're extrapolating. Extrapolation always, always bad. Can we not use AI though? <laughs> okay, I'll I'll actually go to an AI comment later. Um, okay. But <laughs> so, what Sorry. is the problem for helium that they will not be able to see and that they cannot uh, sort of simulate? The, and and why why can we not get um, easy fusion on say tokamak? Uh, even though you know people were predicting this, the the main problem uh, is turbulence. I have, a, I have this uh, in my uh, How Magnetic um, Fusion Works video. So what happens is you have a plasma, so, uh, you know, it can be a tokamak plasma, it can be FRC plasma, field reverse configuration, um, and it's all nice. And according to models, you know, the plasma should be within this kind of boundary. And outside here, this is that, you know, outside that boundary that I showed you before. But what happens is blobs of plasma, because of turbulence, get chucked out. And this guy, the, you know, this blob here goes out to the wall and the plasma is lost and the heat is lost. So this is the main reason, turbulence is the main reason why, um, you know, why tokamaks haven't worked, for example, because if it weren't for turbulence, then they'd, they'd get really high temperatures, they'd have very low losses, and they would have succeeded by now. And, um, and turbulence is something that, um, that, uh, that Helion cannot... Uh, firstly, predict uh, numerically. It gets worse when you get to higher temperatures and when you have um, a um, uh, a uh, sort of you know thermonuclear reactions in there as well. Um, so uh, so it's going to be a, a problem. Well, what about the speed? I mean, they're going very quick. Does Tobin still apply at those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speed? But it's it's uh, yeah. Okay. I'm so, so, F R so not. now, um, in their talk, like, um, again, I'll show, I'll show that, but you can look up the he like Helion, web the Helion uh, YouTube channel. What they talk about a lot is um, magnetohydrodynamic uh, stability. But this is different. This is not magnetohydrodynamics. This cannot be predicted. Well, I, I mean, it can be, but you have, need to have really, really fine detail models. And even then, um, MHD models do not work perfectly. Um, so for their modeling, what um, Helion have, okay, and if you watch, uh, uh, if you watch their, their videos, what they have is a 2D um, a, a resistive MHD code, resistive magnetic hydrodynamics. So firstly, 2D, of course, this is where we live in a 3D world. So what they what they assume, now let's imagine I was I was uh, making a, a pot on like one of those wheels. Let's imagine this is kind of the profile of the pot, right? from the side what 2d what their 2d simulations are they're uh, they're sort of uh, cylindrically symmetric so they simulate this thing and then they assume that it's perfectly you know that way all the way around it's a perfect cylinder with just this side right that there's no variation along the cylinder like you know, if you have a pot on a pottery wheel so this this th 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 this is the simulations that they have to back them um uh, back their sort of findings up, and, and this is the reason they can be, uh, you know, this is what uh, they're confident is because they have they have simulations from 2D axisymmetric magnetohydrodynamic effects. Now, 
if you, and there are such models for you know for all uh, you know for tokamaks for stellarators etc. This is well not stellarators because they're, they're fundamental 3D although mm, they kind of do anyway. But for tokamaks for sure. Now if all you had was an axisymmetric um, 2D MHD model for tokamaks, you would find that the tokamaks is going to work brilliantly. This newfangled, you know, this is the kind of thing they had right back in the 70s, 80s. This newfangled, you know, uh, TFTR or JET, according to our 2D axisymmetric, you know, this kind of pot, uh, pottery wheel um, model, it works brilliantly because there's no turbulence. This uh, this kind of turbulent blob that's flown out, it's it's not, you know, it's not uh, symmetric, right? It's it's just in one place. It's it's not like on a uh, all the way around, like a pot on a potter's wheel. Um, so you, if you watch their videos, you'll see uh, a sort of plot that kind of looks like this. Okay. So what they're saying is that this is kind of the, the plasma shape according to their simulations, and then they've rotated it, um, you know, th uh, 360 degrees, and it's perfectly symmetric. Um, that that's what their um, that's what their simulation is showing. Now I'll give an example. Now by that metric, that this is exactly the kind of um, we'll talk about NIF if we still have time. We're, what's this been? It's been like an hour and a half. Um, so this is the kind of you know uh, this is the kind of uh, simulations that people at NIF did initially that said you know that said that NIF was going to work straight away in about a year. Three years tops, they thought. They had an axis. So for a, for NIF, they will see they have like a spherical compression as opposed to uh, a sort of toroidal one or a fussy. Um, but so there again, you can do 2D. So that so you take a, you take some shell that works like this, looks like this, and you rotate it all the way around to get like a you know a, a cylinder basic. And with there, you know even 2D models worked brilliantly. Didn't work out for real though. When you go to 3D, so these are still simulations, but they're you know they're um, sort of validated and so on. You know you get this big mess, and this is the kind of big mess that the FRCs are going to get as well. And again, I'm not talking about disruptions. I'm talking about uh, so I'm just looking at chat. I'm not talking about disruptions. I'm talking about turbulence, local scale turbulence, and other effects, magnetic islands, um, small scale, you know, uh, gradient instabilities, and so on, current instabilities. These are the these are the reasons that NIF took so long, not just one year, but uh, ten years to get to get there. And these are the reasons the tokamaks uh, don't yet work. If it weren't for this kind of, for, for this turbulence, small scale, not a big MHD, I'm, I'm, a tokamak is MHD stable. Yeah, you, you, they, they run for, you know, hours or whatever. So yes, in their talks, um, Helion have proven that they're MHD stable. If you you know, if you're not in mass, uh, massively in the field, go watch my um, How Fusion Works 3. I'll talk about magnetohydrodynamic instability. But anyway, yes, they've gone to great lengths to show that they're MHD stables and, the, and they don't get disruptions, but they will have um, they will have turbulence, and their codes cannot predict this. This is things that are studied for, you know, years and years uh, experimentally on tokamaks. These are things that get worse as you go in, in temperature. So yeah, a 10, uh, 10 keV tokamak looks great. You take it to 20, 30 keV temperatures, it suddenly becomes, you know, much worse. Okay, and these are things that, that uh, in terms of simulation, there is no great theory for it. Um, you know, yeah, you're going to some going to say, yeah, I've got a great, um, you know, theory for ter like the I don't mean uh, this is theory in the scientific context. So I'm, I'm talking about, you know, like the theory of gravity. There is no great don't don't at me, as they say, you know, I, I've got a, a, a post grad student here that that I, I've helped and, I, uh, you know, helped out and uh, work with who who's, you know, he's published a, what like a 30 page paper about MHD. Uh, you know, turbulence, he, uh, he wouldn't. But if he came to me and said, hey, I actually worked all of turbulence out, uh, all of turbulence uh, theory out, I say, yeah, that's a good start. That 30 page paper, peer reviewed that you've got out, good start. But even, you know, and he's, he's sort of a challenging other, you know, he's, he's showing gaps in other theory and so on. So this is not well theoretically understood. Experimentally, you ha just have to run your machine to see how bad it is, and it will be bad. And Helion cannot, with their two again 2D axisymmetric MHD codes, ca uh, cannot uh, accurately predict it for sure. Even big codes, they would need a supercomputer. There's recently, you know, PPPL. Um, 
published a big, massive supercomputer study. And we're talking, you know, exascale, some of the largest supercomputers in the world. Helium don't have this, um, and and they they cannot predict the turbulence um, that's going to churn um, churn them up uh, strongly. Okay. And so so your so your point is they aren't accurately uh, looking at the plasma, so they can't know for sure what the plasma temperatures are yeah. doing. They're looking uh, at data and then working backwards from a model when likely the model isn't a perfect sphere it's going to be some sort of some sort of mess mm -hmm. and now um, yeah uh, so yeah. to butt in yeah uh that, that's right and uh, what uh, um what's my train of thought yeah the yes you're right that the um they're not looking accurately um they're extrapolating a lot of their observations um they're their model is not going to be perfect because it's going to miss these this turbulence. Mm. I'll come on to another one more reason why. There's a few, there's a few questions in chat, if, okay. I, if, I, if, I, if I may. Um, some chat talking about uh, the uh, AI. Um, and I think the, the issue is that, uh, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, is that because it's a chaotic system, the, the physics means that you can't accurately predict it but i thought i think that's what a chaotic system is there, there may be some elements that you can predict from chaotic systems it's, it's not truly random but to a certain degree you can't always well, predict everything is that, is that fair to say i mean yes to some extent it's um I mean, you know, you can now if you study this, what you can do is you can simply do experiments like JET. Yeah, this is, I guess, my the point uh, it's got to say. What you can do is you can do experiments like JET and you can work out what the conductivity is, right? For example, and and as I say, so if uh, remember, um, I remember I did the oven model. So if you, if it's like you've got the walls of an oven, right? Now. The problem with the turbines is it, it's it's degrading your walls of the oven. It's making it more conductive. And as I said, if you had a if if you had a really good a thermal insulator, the temperature in the middle would rise and you get more fusion. And it, and the turbulence is making the, the heat be conducted more rapidly. It's like your oven having worse walls. That means that the the middle you know if if your oven had worse walls for everything else being uh, you know constant, the middle the temperature in the middle would be worse because that heat is getting conducted away. Right. Um, now, and here's the problem. So, in JET, they can make direct measurements, and and they have uh, they have really good direct measurements. In uh, now, what about helium? What where do they have their you know how how do they model this? They have by their best sort of estimates, they've taken one single value from a 1993 uh, FRC study. And here's oh yeah, I guess this was the problem. So, the reason JET can can know and can measure, um, you know, the effects of turbulence so like so well. It's still not that great, but the reason they can do is because they've got these really good diagnostics, and and because and you know and ultimately now, you know, again, I'll, I'll be I'll be kind to Helion. What Helion are is they they want to engineer stuff. They want to build the best machine. They don't have time to you know, and, and this is good. This is good. they don't want to understand it perfectly. They don't want to have a beautiful theory and 30 pages of theory, um, you know, papers. What they want is the machine to work. So they're just working on engineering the machine. Back in 1993, um, they had a publicly funded machine where they could do this kind of experiments where they could get perhaps better diagnostics. I can't, uh, you know, I'm not perfectly familiar. But my point is, they've taken um, sort of what this is called transport, right? The, the, by, the that conductivity is, is called transport. They've taken transport models and scalings from a 1993 paper of an FRC, which was not as hot as they're going for. And they've taken like one value that they had. Now, you know, just because it was 1993 doesn't doesn't, you know, it's perfectly good science or whatever. But what I'm saying is, they're doing a lot of extrapolating here. And they're not perfectly predicting the turbulence, particularly as that uh, plasma gets hotter um, and becomes thermonuclear. I'll explain one uh, probably. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, in fact, let me talk about this now. So that for this, I'm going to need paint. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not even going to draw on the screen. So if you watch um, Helion's videos where they show their modeling, 
What they'll have, so now remember it's axisymmetric, they'll, they'll sort, of, sort of show it on the side. So what they'll have, um, okay, here's the axis. And the plasma physically, the FRC, looks like this. Okay, that's their model, and let's assume that it was, you know, verified in other machines, whatever that this works. Okay, great. So that's their plasma, uh, in the same, uh, and and then it's, you know, you rotate this round, right? Um, now this axis is, you know, it's it's there's nothing actually physically there. It's it's all plasma, right? So it looks like this basically, and it symmetric, and it will be filled filled with plasma. Okay, here. Um, now here's my point. So. Um, here's another the problem with uh, once you get fusion in there, which they don't have as much fusion. Again, they don't have as many neutrons. They don't as as in, they're going to have in a power plant. So the, what happens? So okay, so you've got a plasma in here, and the uh, again, watch my how fusion works video if you want to know more. I'm not, you know, that's not that's not me being hopefully too obnoxious, but you know, if you really don't know, I think I explained it quite well. Read the textbook, whatever. What they're doing is the 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 way they can find particles is that the particles are doing little gyro orbits. They're doing little uh, uh, actually real engineering did this, yeah. Uh, so the particles are orbiting around magnetic field lines in circles, and these are uh, now the magneto hydrodynamic approximation, which it, it, like I say, it's an approximation which fails, and there's a lot of ways that it, it can fail. You know, it's it's good. You, we use MHD, or you know, people use MHD for tokamaks, and it works to some extent. But like all models that fails, right? Um, it works if these little gyro radii are small compared to the the size of the whole machine, okay, or the or the whole plasma rather, right? And and you know, I'm sure that yeah, in fact, yeah, they 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 show this whatever that indeed they are for ten. So for the ions that are you know ten kV ions, let's say. So ions at the temperature, uh, um, well, uh, with energies typical of the temperature that they have there. Then these circles are small, and MHD, you know, let's say works quite well. Okay, great. But now let's imagine that what we have is we now have a, a, a um, you know, let's say a D, a deuterium helium three reaction. Okay, um, and so. A, a, that creates a proton with 14.7 uh, mega electron volts of energy, uh, so uh, 1,400 times more than the typical energies they have. Because it's 1,400 times more, the gyro radius is bigger. And so what happens? So the gyro radius is so, might be so big that this, I, this uh, proton now leaves the machine. MHD will not predict this and will in no way, you know, the, the MHD will not solve this. And if it leaves the machine, it's carrying all that fusion energy out. Other possibilities, again, I talk about this as drifts. Um, so if you have the, uh, in the, maybe the magnetic field is enough to make it, make the, um, you know, it, it is a bigger gyro radius, but not too big. But what can happen is, um, so the magnetic field is a weaker here on axis slightly than uh, than out here. So what happens is that the the gyro orbit is is tighter here. So it'll do these kind of spirals, right? If there's a gradient, uh, I mean, I explain this. But so there's drifts, uh, and again, these drifts not covered by. Um, by MHD, ideal MHD or even a resistive MHD, which is what they have, not covered by drift kinetics. They kind of mentioned that they don't really have a code, but they, they have some drift kinetic uh, scalings. And so that, this kind of stuff, and, and not only can it leave, now if it leaves that's, and hits the wall, that's it, that fusion energy is gone. Okay, but also, um, not only is this going to fly out, and of course, if it's a tritium, if it's DD, um, if it's a triton with a lot of energy and big, right, it's going to go to the wall, it's going to get absorbed, all this bad stuff. Okay, there's that. Um, and also, now it may be captured and, and be inside here still, right, with larger gyrated. But the other thing is it will drive instabilities um, and, uh, and other problems, okay? It's um, not going to be a perfect sphere. That's essentially, that's essentially well, no, what I'm saying is it's, e it's either going to cause other instabilities or it's going to leave completely. OK, and so um, and, and this cannot be predicted uh, by uh, by the codes they have, because this is beyond resistive MHD, which is the codes that they have. Um, and it gives 
other fusion researchers a lot of headaches, firstly simulating this stuff and so on, uh, and the, the potential of this to drive instabilities. And this is also crucial. They don't have this right now. So and, and they haven't in the 1993, you know, even if it was the best experiment in the world, until you do have a lot of um, uh, fusion reactions, you are not going to have this because you're not going to have, you know, this is a, we're talking about a fusion product being born here. So these are things that give a lot of, you know, there are whole papers, <coughs> some by me, <coughs> published about these sorts of problems and the instabilities they cause, okay, um, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but what I'm saying is, objectively speaking, Helion cannot be modeling this by their own admission because their code cannot, you know, resistive MHD, if you just know about this, does not have finite um, ion gyro radii. Just a, a fact, um, and, and this, you know, again, this is going to be a problem, and it's and it hasn't been experimentally tested. That's my other point. That this this just has not been extensively experimentally tested. Now, is this why they say that the gyro radius is larger? I don't know, but uh, again, um, they did mention drift, um, but not enough. You know, not dri uh, responding to a comment. They did mention drift, but they didn't mention. You know, like yeah, they they. Of course, this these drifts are happening to like the thermal slow small gyro radii, but they're smaller. the The drift itself is smaller for the smaller gyro radii. The, the the colder, you know, not cold, but like colder than these fusion products because the the guys in here are at ten me uh, ten kV, right, roughly, uh, you know, plus or minus because that that's what a thermal is. We'll talk about it. We we'll probably won't have time actually now to talk about what thermal is because that's going to be another two hours, um, which I hope to. But OK, so so anyway, again, can they overcome this? Uh, you know, absolutely. But these are things that plague um, and plague even, uh, you know, of, of fusion sciences. And they have whole teams larger than Helium's whole team uh, working on this in in Tokamaks. And it's a problem there. It's going to be a problem for Helion as well. Does it matter? So this is what so my question is, if you have uh, input energy uh, driving the initial coils, smashing the plasmas together, and you measure your energy out through the coils at the center, does it does it does it realistically matter okay. exactly what's going on in between? So that, the problem with that as well, from an energy capture perspective, is that they rely on magnetohydrodynamics for their proposed. Um, a proposed energy capture. So let me give a brief schematic by the, you know, I'm explaining what they say, I'm not challenging it. Um, so what they what they want to do is they want to start with a cold and uh, not dense plasma. Okay, I'm drawing it here schematically. And what they want to do is they, uh, and I'm showing this, so this is going to be time along, not, not physically space, and very schematically, very bare bones, don't start lawyering me on this, okay. What they're going to do is they're going to adiabatically compress that so they're going to squeeze it. It's going to heat up by their own, um, uh, you know, by their own sort of plan, right? Once it's squeezed and it's hot, then thermonuclear reactions start. And uh, so, so they they they've taken some energy, squeezed it down. Still the same amount of energy. Adiabatic means they don't heat or you know it doesn't. They don't gain or lose heat. Now, as every second. Uh, well, not even, so, but as every student of um, you know engineering student knows, per, like adiabatic. Uh, compression or expansion in principle, formally speaking, is impossible because it would take infinitely long. So, okay, it's an approximation. Um, I don't have time to like uh, lawyer that. Let's say they do. Um, they do have near enough adiabatics. So they compress it. Now you've got higher density, higher temperature. Now you've got fusion. So now after a certain time more, uh, I'm going to draw it, say, as a red, um, you know, as a red thing, it's it's even hotter and um, and then well, it's even hotter, let's say, than it was before. So now, when they expand it, so let's say the blue was was really cold, or you know, relatively cold at least. Now, when they expand it, um, you know, they extract they extract the energy. Um, so actually, yeah. So actually, it'll it'll still be blue. But the point is that they've used magnetic fields, as they've said, and and this relies on ideal MHD or you know MHD at least magnetic hydrodynamics to extract that energy. Um, 
Now, the problem is, so, so they say they, they extract energy because now when this adiabatically expands, it does work against the magnetic field. It, it, um, the plasma sort of pushes the magnetic field out, which is the case if magnetohydrodynamics holds. But if you have finite, uh, uh, you know, and very large iron um, uh, gyro radii, the ions are lost, and also they're not, you know, they're no longer... Um, contributing to an MHD, they're no longer pushing on the field like a uh, a normal, uh, you know, sort of uh, plasma like that uh, will do. Okay, so that um, that also is going to scupper their, um, you know, the their uh, adiabatic expansion. Or, or the, yeah, the, the adiabatic expansion after they've done the fusion. Besides, it's just being lost. You know, ions just being completely lost. It's not. Is that not just? change the output, say, from 100 yeah. okay. to you know, but, 80 or something. Well, okay, but so what I'm saying is, um, uh, you know, that's going to hamper their, their um, uh, yeah, you know, energy output. Now, the other important thing to note here, so let's, let me, uh, so you compress down to here, let's say, in time, do some fusion, um, and then decompress again. Now, in principle, what they would like is this starting, um, the, the starting here uh, f plasma to be like, you know, basically, uh, you know, really cold, like, you know, zero temperature effectively and totally, you know, zero density. And then they, uh, you know, then they compress it, right? And the, the temperature rises. And that would mean, so if they started basically with zero temperature, you know, I'd, I'd ideal zero temperature, they would, uh, and, and ended with it, Right, they would, they could have. Let's even forget the fusion. They they could have like a perfect, you know, perfect efficiency. Whatever they put in at the start, they get out back at the end. Okay, if they had a perfect, um, you know, if they started basically at zero temperature. But what realistically will happen is that they can't start this whole compression, you know, magnetic compression, MHD compression at you know at really low temperature. So if you try to, if 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 this was uh, at room temperature. So remember, they start with, let's say, low temperature, maybe, uh, you know, a, mil ten, a million degrees, let's say, get it up to the plan is to get it up to 100, 200 million degrees. That's when it does the fusion. Then it becomes effectively hotter. So when they expand it, it will do more work than they put in. Yeah. Um, and as I say, that would be um, perfectly efficient if you started with zero temperature, but they don't start. They cannot start and end at zero, te uh, you know, obviously not. Zero temperature is actually impossible, but they cannot even start this below, say, a million degrees, and because again, MHD will not hold. If so, if you just had a gas and you try to squeeze it and then unsqueeze it with a magnetic field, like the, the squeezing here is being done by the uh, applied magnetic field. If you try to do this to a neutral gas, it's not it's it's not going to respond to that magnetic field. So what you need is you need it to be conductive enough and hot enough, basically. So. What and so when it comes out at the end, you know, you put it in at a million degrees, it'll come out at the end at the million degrees, and that plasma will be kind of wasted. They can no longer extract energy in this way. They can't extract useful work from it. So what I'm saying is that that kind of limits the, mm, you know, that sort of sets a limit on how much energy they need to put it into it into it in the first place. So this, the the work here, you know, what they get if they had no fusion, what they put in, they get out. Um, but the the energy to get it to that, so things like, for example, in the, in the a real engineering video, they said this would be via uh, radio frequency heating and so on. That is wasted, okay, for every pulse. So this will limit how efficiently this sort of compression and expansion, you know, um, work work is basically. So, what, but what I'm saying, so what I'm saying is that the energy. Uh, to, to be clear, to sum this up, I even if everything works perfectly and with perfect efficiency, the energy that they used to heat the reactants to the first, say, million degrees, right, is going to be wasted. That's that's the summary. That's the the headline. Uh, okay, in, perfect. Thank right? you for summarizing that. Yeah, it, but that but that doesn't mean you know. So that in in the nuclear fusion uh, uh, reaction. You can still produce more energy than um, that's that starting point, obviously. You, 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 yeah, in principle. But th what I'm saying is that this limits, um, you know, practically 
right? This means they're going to need to do a lot of fusion now. They can't, remember, if we woo, uh, rewind all the way back, I said, for example, they started with 50, 50, uh, and they went to 49, 49, and maybe they could reduce th some of the stuff by having less reactions on, or if they just did have fewer reactions so that basically not all of it reacted, you know, that, uh, uh, and if their reactivity was low, remember I was talking about low reactivities, right? This is going to limit them a lot again. Mm -hmm. Okay, because because so th so what I'm saying is that the energy cost now even if all this adiabatic stuff in here was perfectly efficient, what I'm saying is that the you know the energy cost each shot uh, is going to have a, a you know a, an energy cost of at least uh, raising the plasma to a million degrees. You know, doing things like ionizing it, for example. So that's a you know 13.6 um, electron volts each. Well, that's not that much, but you know, but it'll add up if they if not all of it reacts right. No, like I say, you, you're heating, um, which it won't all react. So now you know. So let's say that you have to heat the whole, you know, you have to heat your whole hundred percent um, to a million degrees, but uh, only one percent reacts. So that one percent has to give off enough energy. Um, that the uh, you know that to, to the offsets the heating the whole hundred percent. I mean, does that kind of math? Yeah, you know, I mean, again, napkin math. This is a, a <laughs> yeah. this is what I call butt math, right? This numbers <laughs> I pull out my ass. Fair enough. Um, fair, I pull out yeah. my butt. Uh, yeah. But okay. But you know, this is what's going to hamper them. And now you add on top all the other problems we just talked about. You add on top the fact that you're going to have turbulence. So, um, so oh, well, just, just just taking this one step back, step back. Using the 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 um, the magnetic um, well, the expansion to drive the magnets to actually uh, generate the electricity. Would that not be a more efficient process in generating electricity than? Um, heating water, creating steam, and driving a turbine as a as an as an uh, you know because obviously that in in that process is obviously not going to be one hundred percent efficient. Would, would would it could it not be you know more efficient? And then the net, okay, the input is more difficult, but the output is more efficient. You know, but that it's uh, reasonable. Yeah, well, I'll come on to that maybe, but um, yes. So this is one of their major things that this is like really more more efficient than heating steam. But my point is that they're going to have their work cut out for them. So the, what I've drawn this little guy here, that's mm. an example. Uh, you know, that's that's some plasma loss to, due to turbulence, which, like I say, they can't predict and they don't know. Uh, I'll draw a green guy here. This is um, this is a fusion product that was lost to the walls or whatever and is gone and didn't uh, didn't push back on the ma magnets because, like I say, not per not ideal MHD uh, and also you know just lost the wall. Um, so. Um, so a lot of challenges here with how they make energy. Some, you know, the advantage is if they do it again, I'd be, you know, I'd be super happy for them. Um, and then these are just challenges that they would have overcome. Fair enough. But um, if they do do it, but um, more challenges to, to just uh, for them working. Now with the good news with the um, so not maybe not a tokamak, but uh, well, so, so for a stellarator, certainly in principle for a stellarator, what you could have, okay, is the following situation. Now, um, so you need to um, you need to heat it, um, of course, uh, and you're losing heat. But um, with a tokamak, the good thing is because they're getting so that the energy that you the, you're boiling the water with comes from the neutrons, but some of the energy when you're having DT fusion. Some of the energy is in a helium-4 that stays in the plasma and keeps heating the plasma. So in principle, for a stellarator, for example, that and that helium-4 could, could heat just enough to overcome all the losses. So you basically don't need an input. They could have an infinite you know, engineering queue, or not engi an infinite, like, say, physics queue, to, if we want to get Sabina Hossenfelder involved here. Um, they could... They could Potentially, in a tokamak or a stellarator, have a situation where they switch off the external heating and the plasma is heating itself. All you're doing is you're putting in fuel. Some of that, you know, the fuel reacts DT. Um, some, you know, some of that reaction energy is kept in to keep the plasma hot. It continues to, uh, you know, do thermonuclear reactions. A neutron flies out of the magnetic field, carrying enough energy. New that neutron breeds. 
more tritium because you have um, this. I'm revisiting topics if I'm going too fast for people, but they're covered in the previous videos. That neutron can breed actually more than one tritium. If you have a beryllium reaction, the beryllium will give you two neutrons and N two N reaction. So you can breed more tritium just to kind of not you know no, no perf process perfect. So in a perfect for the for the conventional approach. Um, now, for tokamaks, you still need to drive a current. Again, I go through this. Um, so you probably still will need for a tokamak a little bit of input power, but that can be small in principle. But what you can have is, you know, practically, uh, you know, well, I mean, that's per infinite efficiency. Yeah, you put in zero. Now, yeah, OK, so you still need to break down. So this is how it's different. You still need to give it that same, you know, for initial energy, which I said. But with helium, they lose that, f uh, you know, with uh, and the point, sorry. They do lose that, but with helium, they have to give that every time. They have to reionize everything all the time. Now, guy who's spamming, whose uh, initials are EM, have a think about this, buddy. Okay, um, so you're saying, you know, you're saying you don't need to like recombine it, or you don't get some energy back. Now, if you don't. Um, uh, how the plasma recombine. How are you going to pump out? You were saying you can pump out tritium perfectly well. How are you going to pump out that tritium if you don't recombine? Once it recombines, no more MHD, can't use their whole driver thing, that energy is lost. So if you can't do this for helium and you, ha you have to do it every pulse, you're going to be losing energy. OK? So. Yeah. Uh, and, and the point is, the point is not that um, uh, you can't be creating energy here mm -hmm. it's just that your uh, q value your your total q value mm -hmm. will be uh, reduced so you're going to have a you can have a reduction in uh, the turbulence you're going to have a reduction in the tritium decay you're going to have a, a reduction in the fact that it's not going to be a perfect sphere in the magnetic field driving the the, the uh, alpha current um i mean all of these things you know um are well not not there are obvious similar problems with other systems um you're never going to get a system that is necessarily perfect i mean even your uh you know your example of an infinite q is unrealistic it's you know that's well on, if on it's the, no no i mean you know if you light a if you light a uh, you know petrol drum on fire as long as you keep adding petrol yeah, it's infinite Q. Well, yeah. That, okay, no, no, infinite no, physics, no, whatever. Now, yeah, let's yeah. also jump <laughs> yeah. in. By the way, so, yeah, getting caught. Oh, but they claim they can have, you know, 95%. So this is another thing that's going to happen. I predict this now. Okay, what's going to happen is they're going to have, you know, Sabina Hossenfeld is going to come in here eventually and have a, and, and this is going to be a big bun fight of what, what, they, what the helium mean by Q. So, yes, the, what you will be able to do, what helium will be able to do somewhere in here is they're going to draw a line and they're going to draw a line here and they say that between these two the adiabatic process right is is 95 percent efficient okay and so great whatever but the the what they need to do is is uh you know draw the goalposts here what's the efficiency um like it, let's say there was no fusion what's the efficiency they put in a, a energy here without fusion of course they're going to have less at the end here what is that going to be for the full total cycle and operating at one hertz or badum 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 at least or ten hertz whatever, and um, mm -hmm. and that's that's my point. Um, do you want to hit me with questions? Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I would love to try and hit you with some questions. That sounds brilliant. What does NIF reaching burning plaza mean for the future of fusion power? And I think this question more relates to. What does fusion, studying fusion in general lead to the sort of the result of fusion power? I think it's I think it's a sort of more generic question, which is possibly good. So, what does studying f fusion now mean uh, for the future? Um, well, obviously, there's a lot of you know there are a lot of um, you know overlaps and similarities. So it is you know if you're talking about synergies, like yeah, there's some. A lot of it though, you do you know if you're studying FRCs. The, you know, you have to really dig deep and study FRC specifically. You can't necessarily transfer that, you know, entirely to, to Tokamaks. I don't know. I mean, so for example, okay, 
well, I'll really, I'll, if, if I'm not in trouble now uh, from, from the people I used to work with or whatever, they'll definitely be. But so, for example, um, a code I worked with um, on Tokamax was being used for FRCs. Pretty sure, it was, well, in fact, I'm sure it wasn't for FRCs for Helion, which does have, uh, you know, it's gyrokinetic code. So, um, uh, um, so, uh, so it does have some of this, it, some of these issues with uh, not, they're not entirely with um, Gyro Ready, but uh, but Helion aren't using. Uh, so there's there's a lot of overlap. Now, Nif, I'll come on to if we actually, well, yeah, if we have time, I actually probably. Well, I think we're starting to run out. Of yeah, we probably. I, I was. Um, da -da 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 -da. I'll quickly answer these. I was gonna. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask a question on uh, the PB cycle. Um, OK. Would that make it e an easier engineering task? It'll be easy engineering, but it's going to be a really, really hard physics task. Interesting. I thought that would not be your answer. Um, surely the high temperatures would be yeah, okay, a very but, difficult engineering task. But, you know, if you assume that, okay, you just put some coils there and you can somehow magically get to high temperatures, then yeah, okay. Uh, it's a, but it's a physics challenge, right? It's, it's, you're talking about the physics of the confinement. You know, it, like mm -hmm. if the physics can, if you can get to a, hundred, uh, to a billion uh, degrees with, you know, the same antenna, then it's fine. Engineers are happy, but. I'm going to say that's semantic, but yes, fair enough. Uh, difficult approach, and mainly because of the temperature, I guess. Um, um, okay, uh, I was going to. Oh, I was going to do. I was going to embarrass myself. Um, okay, yeah. So um, uh, this is an email I got. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here, um, but the one really good point here, and I was thinking this myself. Now remember. Remember, they uh, what I said is they're using results from like 1993. Okay, for, for some of them, some are even older. Yeah, a lot of their sources, are like for example, one of their videos, actually this one linked, uh, you know, linked here. But if you look on Helion, they, they have two, you know, big ones. One is uh, well, on the Helion official YouTube. Um, they have two two main videos. They have a talk at Princeton that I watched. Um, that, that is similar to the to what they have anyway so um a lot of their references are from before you know even 1990 it's quite old so the question is um and this is a very good question if the transport models they use are correct and you know i've talked about why transport models and so on and what the limitations are and how it's going to all be challenged if they if their transport models are correct why aren't there any frc machines now tae technologies also have an frc machine of course you know spoiler alert for this video what helion are saying is yeah frcs are great you know and if we put dt in there it'll be super duper great you know so uh, hey why has no one ever you know um, what, why hasn't, if they're so great, why hasn't there, now this is, again, this isn't proof, you know, this isn't strictly, yeah, maybe this is the first time, fair enough, but, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a kind of burden of proof is on them kind of thing. Again, I can't prove a negative, but, you know, it really makes you question if a far seas are so great, why they have, uh, and remember, there's a lot of like, like, let's say they run DT, um, there's a lot of sort of clout if they're the first to show, you know, Q10, Right, even if it's a physics queue, whatever, um, then uh, it's uh, you know that it's someone would do it. So it's it's a very um, if it were that easy, someone would have done it. The publicly funded ones, which, like I say, have much better diagnostics than Helion have, um, would have uh, would have shown that. Um, one thing I didn't say, I guess so. Uh, Again, I talked about speed running the history of fusion. So, for example, now this, this actually this is a gr this, this would be a great uh, video, and I might do this with the, one of the guys that did this originally, and they flew. It was like it's a real spy thrill thing. So the, the, this remember I talked about laser, high, uh, you know, Thompson scattering, right? The, the first they did the first time they did this, they flew a laser from Britain in 1969 to the USSR. Uh, um, to measure the tokamak. This is why tokamaks are so dominant, because, and, and it is great, it's like, there's a guy who wrote a story, 
uh, about this. Uh, look him up, Michael J. Forrest um, and his book. It's like um, they, they, they had, you know, their, their rooms when they were in the USSR in 1969 were bugged by the KGB. So it's like um, they, they the light bulb broke or whatever, right? They need a new light bulb. They just talked into the wall. Hey, the light bulb's broken. The following day, you know, they go out, they come back. The following day, the light bulb's magically fixed itself. You know, it's a great story about how they did this. Um, you know, be good to cover, I guess. But um, so what happened is they flew and they, the, to the Soviets invented the um, tokamak while people in the U.S. were going with the stellarator. They had a lot of experience with stellarators. Um, and what they did after, the, after they measured the tokamak and it was so great, much better than the what they had. OK, they, at first, they didn't believe the Russians, by the way. So, so this is my point. Yeah. You know, these are scientists. The Russians are reporting, the Soviets are reporting that they this new this new tokamak is great. Um, you know, obviously, well, it's Cold War. But, you know, even even if they weren't, you know, Cold War enemies, you know, the rest of the scientists are skeptical. Why? You know, your tokamak is so much better than our stellarators. They thought it was, you know, fairly equivalent. So at first, didn't trust them at all had to fly out, get good diagnostics, uh, practically invented uh, Thomson scattering on, you know, in plasma physics, or at least, you know, certainly advanced it a lot, measured it, confirmed the tokamaks are great. In Princeton, they had a stellarator, or they were building a stellarator. In like three years, they converted this stellarator into a tokamak, okay? So, you know, this, you know, you're talking about all oh, the public funded people, you know, you can't agree on anything or, you know, you're just bloated or whatever. Right back, or certainly at least back in the day, bam, you know, converted. So, you know, again, well, that was, uh, I wanted to show something. I'll show, I'll embarrass myself in a moment by showing something I went too far. But um, so the, the question here, why no one else has done it, you know, when there are other FRCs and, um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, people can convert them and so on. So this is a big, big, you know, a big red flag, to be honest. You know, if it's so great, why is, hasn't it succeeded? And my suggestion, uh, you know, not a not perfect proof, of course, you know, uh, burden of proof and all that. But um, my suggestion is all these problems with things like turbulence and so on. So once you actually go scale up it'll be a problem uh i first will answer re this is the real engineering's comment and my answer to him i just said um uh, you know I, I or real engineering was very uh, sort of miffed and very sad and called me oh this is the point he called me you are uh, you know he he re related me to to a youtuber called thunderfoot old like i was splitting hairs and i wasn't being fair on well on them on their team that you know i was oh the criticism of helion uh, shouldn't be criticism of, of their video, although I think it's very fair that, you know, they presented, you know, facts about Helion, facts that are, you know, even objectively, I mean, Helion agrees with me that they will have, you know, neutrons, right? So they, they will need shielding, they're building shielding in, in their big video, for some reason, uh, you know, the, in their 30 minute video, now, I, you know, I don't know how to make video compared to them, they get millions of views, whatever, fair enough, I, I shouldn't be telling them how to make a video. But Somehow, the the luminaries, the YouTube luminaries that they are, um, real engineering, you know, didn't mention, hey, there's, you're going to need neutron shielding, and they're calling me a thunderfoot. Now that uh, this, it's a, I didn't really like this um, uh, this YouTuber. So this was actually, um, it's actually, it's quite embarrassing. But I, I sort of tried to. He does uh, Thunderfoot does this like this thing busted, uh, and and he really splits hairs. I hope I wasn't, you know, I, and I don't think I was splitting hairs. I was, I think I've been, you know, pretty damn fair about criticism and so on. Uh, but I did do, I did do a hair splitting of Thunderfoot video. I was going to show you. We don't, don't have time. Um, I can re-upload this. This was from, uh, you know, uh, this wasn't from this channel. It's from. Uh, 2018 that I made this. Um, it's actually it is about uh, it's about plasma physics though. But uh, and I was going to show this if we had time, but we just do not um, have time. But I can post this or whatever. Um, quickly, some errata. Uh, even if we don't have time, I do want to cover errata. So one thing was that I plotted Rutherford. Uh, this is a very technical thing, but if you if you watch this, I plotted uh, Rutherford scattering and formally. Um, I did. I forgot to mention it was at precisely four degrees. So this is why. Um, 
so this is this is the main reason why you can't have like beam target fusion, for example. So uh, because the the particles will scatter. So st you know statistically, for every um, for for a particle to fuse, even for DT. Um, so, you know, it has to collide, of course, but um, statistically it has to collide. I go through this in another video. It has to collide like thousands of times um, and and bef uh, before it will fuse. And the other, th so one in, say, a thousand or 10,000 times it will fuse. The other 900, whatever, 9,999 times it will scatter by Rutherford scattering. But just to be clear, I didn't put the text describing there was scattering by a certain angle. That's a very technical point, but uh, uh, technically an errata. Or in a rotten. Uh, right, NIF in uh, 18 minutes, but I actually think we could do this. So, NIF, uh, comments on NIF. A lot of this I have commented in the videos. I appreciate that I won't be as sarcastic now. You know, I appreciate not many of you, you know, it wasn't recommended to you and so on. Um, but I do actually, you know, a lot of the points um, I talk about NIF. So, what is NIF? NIF, very basically, is what they've done is they've um, um, from the peaceful fusion side, at least, what they've done is, uh, so nukes work, thermonuclear weapons work, and they work because they have a primary, um, you know, they have a primary fission bomb, and then they have a fusion bomb. And NIF is a basic, in very basic terms, is attempting to use these massive lasers. This is like, you know, five football pitches or whatever they talk about. Um, so NIF is using 192 lasers. Oops. Uh, is using 192 lasers to replace basically the fission part of a nuke, make it much smaller and manageable. So now you're going to have tiny, mini, dinky little nukes um, uh, that are driven by lasers, not fission. So you complete fusion, no fission, um, and you can make power that way, right? Um, and of course, uh, so okay. First and foremost, if we don't, if we if we have to go immediately, if we can't. Um, uh, by the way, if you have to go. Uh, buddy of mine, then let me know. Um, but yeah, this is entertaining. Uh, this is this is well worth the wait. Okay. I'm, I'm loving it. I might strictly get kicked out, but hopefully not. Okay. Of of I'm in a secret location. Uh, this is another very obscure channel reference, but I I'm in a secret location, but it's it is in a studio, uh, but it's not in Brentford. Uh, very important, not a Brentford studio. So true fans of the channel will get the reference. Now, um, uh, okay. So this is strictly an erratum. Um, so. Uh, I do did a video that broadly describes uh, how NIF works, and I uh, claimed that so it has lasers, and I claimed that they use a specific. Uh, I claimed that they used neodymium doped yttrium lithium fluoride YLF ILF whatever uh, lasers. This is what I claimed they use. Now this chappy here, very valued, um, you know. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not centering their name very valuable valued um, uh, subscriber of this channel and I genuinely and this is you know if you, I'm sure you'll watch this afterwards um, I genuinely would have had uh, been happy to have you come on uh, this stream you know talk whatever um, apparently now you know that was a genuine offer apparently though at, at NIF right now it's sort of middle of the day and they're having their lasers cleaned or whatever so Mr. you know Muonium here or Dr. Muonium perhaps um, is is busy but I, I would have loved to have you on um, uh, but so they corrected me um, that in fact NIF use um, uh, neodymium glass Neodymium dope, you know, phosphate glass, but neodymium glass lasers, as they're commonly known, uh, gives a very good explanation of why that is. It's definitely an erratum in my video about this, but I do uh, the rest he does say is pretty good. So do watch my video about uh, inertial fusion. Now, this something I I was a claimed erratum. The second bit was apparently I was wrong, but no, I I think and indeed I think in the comments I convinced Muonium, um, and I am right that uh, you know basically. For NIF, what you want is you want to have the higher frequency, so the um, you know frequency of light, like uh, the bluer it is, the higher the frequency is of light. So you want to, and um, these lasers operate in infrared. So what you want to do is you want to convert infrared laser light um, into ultraviolet light. That has a a um, energy penalty. Actually, we'll get in. If we do have time, we'll get into that. But it's worth taking an energy hit, an efficiency hit, on converting infrared light into um, ultraviolet um, for the purpose because the plasma physics are much, much better. 
uh, and that it, you know, so, so I was right, and I, I'm sorry, you know, you were right. You, it, there may be other reasons that it's worse, but it, that is why they do it. Um, it penetrates deep into the plasma. As I say, it's just a basic. Uh, if you know about plasma frequency, it's like a, you know, if you study plasma physics, one of the first things you learn. Um, right, and he braces my uh, that that picture that I showed earlier. I mean, it's not my picture, but um, anyway. Um, so let's go on then with those errata done. Let's go on to NIF. Oh, and so here's a, yeah, by the way, so in from the video, I claim this. And to be clear, wrong. It is, in fact, neodymium um, doped glass, which then it does get the frequency tripled, though, at an inefficiency uh, cost to ultraviolet. Um, right. Okay. So the first, this is a good point. So why does NIF actually exist? Why is, you know, people say, oh, we waste so much money on fusion research as NIF. What a waste of, you know, money or whatever. Um, so the reason, if you, uh, the, NIF, the primary reason uh, NIF exists is that um, so that they can do classified experiments to do, you know, that bit I said that they're replacing the fission part of a nuke with a fusion. They can do, they could change it up slightly and they can do classified experiments and basically test nukes. Now, I'm not going to, you know, if, if there's anyone who's got a problem with nukes or whatever, I'm not going to, like, um, is, that, is that stream still live, by the way? Uh, y yes, it is, as far as I can tell, anyway. Can someone say if it's live, by the way? Someone respond? Yeah, okay. Uh, we have, yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> Just in case. Um, okay. I am, I, can, hang on. Can, can I just ask chat? Who has been here since the beginning? Because I am very impressed. Wait five minutes. Oh, well, 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 they answer. Give us a whoop, whoop if you're still, you know, if you're from the OG gang or at least re reasonably. I've, I've seen that it's ticked up. Okay, yeah, fine. Um, um, so, um, anyway, my point was that what they're doing is testing nukes. It's to get around the nuclear test ban treaty because, um, uh, you know, so they are testing nukes without actually officially exploding a nuclear bomb. Um, so, and now, again, I'm not going to convince anyone here, let's not have a political debate or whatever, whether nukes are wrong or whatever. I'm not going to convince anyone, but the, you know, Congress wants to fund this. So we are getting free stuff, and I say this in the video, we're getting free um, peaceful fusion research. We're also getting cool stuff like, um, you know, astrophysics experiments. So what they do is, you know, now instead of um, setting off a mini nuke with the lasers, they're setting off a little thing that looks like a mini astro, uh, like a mini, you know, supernova, whatever. Um, and, you know, obviously there's ex extrapolation there. They'll they'll scale things and, and so on. So cool science for free with the um, with the stewardship of the uh, American thermonuclear um, you know, weapons program. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yes, so this comment says, yeah, it's, it's well, it doesn't violate it. It's it's to, to, to test ban. Now, you can also say, you know, I don't know what kind of mind games there are. So, for example, n it, right, you remember nukes, a lot of it is about uh, being sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's about d deterring. They don't want to use them. They just want to show everyone that they've got them. And so maybe NIF is part of that, that it's like, look, we know they work because we've got this facility. You know, we're spending billions in this facility to, to know that proves to people. Well, so, you know, this kind of stuff, us mere mortals aren't going to know, but we're getting free science. So saying, oh, gee, what's the point of funding NIF? Mm, it's, you know, as we'll see the, the, the criticism, they, including me, have, you know, well, the point is to do to do nuke stuff, which, you know, is, is a foregone conclusion anyway, um, you know. Um, OK, so, of course, what they did and I got a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm sure the people that are watching this are, you know, know the criticisms here, but a lot of people said, well, you know, what they said was that, hey, um, you know, they, they announced they got more energy out than they put in. Um, uh, now, I uh, hope I don't have to explain to anyone here, but just in case, I will. So, of course, so this is this the the two megajoules that they put in is in laser energy, and the 3.15 megajoules is in neutrons, 
primarily. So what they would have to do is they would have to take the 3.15 you know, boil water, drive a steam turbine, it's DT, by the way, um, drive a steam turbine, make electricity, pump the laser. So they meet. So that was the first, you know, ha ha, you're wrong. We've got fusion energy now, loser, uh, wave of comments. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, so that was the first surface level comment. Um, and, that, uh, and then, of course, there was then the whiplash that actually to make two megajoules of laser energy, oh, actually, you need, I mean, factually, at, at NIF, you need, you know, whatever it is, 200 or whatever megajoules. So, so actually, they turned 200 megajoules of, of laser energy and they got 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy out now of course now and i should also say again i'm sure most of you that are what you know dedicated enough to watch this oh i got a super chat yeah. um it was a very kind one uh, by the way if you thank you very much for super chats i have had some and i will answer each if i will definitely address each super chat um for sure i just did uh, uh, yeah um so and we did have a couple didn't we um, so we had we had one we had a, fi a five dollar one or whatever that was um, also just kind. I had one at the start, but I might have. Oh, I've got I've got that as a. It as was a, a question. question. Hope you talk about less confined fusion. Okay, because of that, I will, we will have to go on longer because of that. Uh, super chat at the start. We will have to <laughs> get to the lattice confinement. Uh, but okay. So thank you very much to everyone um, for for that, and thank you to the to um, Cameron just now. Okay. So um, now, of course, one thing I should say. So in the world, in the universe now, okay. Before this experiment, there was an amount of sort of you know free energy, and there was an amount of nuclear potential energy, and so. In terms of kind of free non-potential energy in the world, after this there was 3.15 megajoules more energy. So, you know, um, effectively, uh, what came out, what must have come out then of that machine is, if if it was 200 input, um, th then 203.15 is what must have been in there. But still, if you um, if we talk about, we, we might get to thermodynamics, um, but basically you can't you can't take 203.15 megajoules of thermal energy and turn them into uh, 200 megajoules of, of electrical energy, uh, unless you're in space or whatever. So you have to you know look up basically um, you know for now I, I actually do want to do a video on this, but um, look up you know a Carnot engine. So basically on Earth where you have um, you know, at that kind of current temperatures, you, you just can't do it. So, um, so anyway, so, so the, the, the claim was I'm wrong because we already have fusion energy. The counter immediately backswing was that it's super inefficient the way it is now. And I'm in the middle. And I, again, you can watch my video. But again, I appreciate I'm not going to sarcastically say dismissively say you do this. Uh, I appreciate not many of you have. But the takeaway here um, is that so lasers can be more efficient. Right now, NIF's lasers are very inefficient, but that was a deliberate choice. They deliberately chose that they want good big lasers now that work, and that in parallel, while they did the physics experiments, in parallel, what they've been doing, and they have done this, is developed more efficient lasers. And they now have, now, so they, so, they they have extremely, this is for lasers, 1.8 megajoules of laser energy is extremely large. Um, so they don't have, you know, to, 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 to just to build this, you want any laser that, that puts this out, you, you're going to need billions. But for, you know, for more ma billions of dollars, um, but for more manageable, you know, small lasers, they have demonstrated a laser that can operate first. Uh, well, this will be important later, but it can do high repetition rate, da -da 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 -da, machine gun level at. And the efficiency is 10 percent, which is way higher than what NIF is. And, and there was a deliberate choice for NIF to be less efficient. So if you if you take um, NIF's current efficiency, you know, a potential power plant, even, you know, a very conceivable, realistic power plant will be much more efficient. So as a breakdown, as an example for what a, a an inertial power plant might look like is you start with 20 megajoules of electricity, 10 percent efficiency into a laser beam with a sort of physical, you know, Q, but really this is just Q. We don't, there is no Q 
Q total is plasma, as, as, as Sabina Hostenfelder calls it. Q plasma is really the, the Q. Um, so that two megajoules, a Q of 25, and that's reachable, um, can be turned to 50 megajoules and then converted or, you know. Now the thing is, so this is another thing. Um, so in principle, um, these Qs can also be near infinity because, um, uh, okay, I'll rewind back. Uh, why can the um, why can the uh, why uh, inertial pure inertial laser inertial fusion you know forgetting magnetized target fusion which is what um, a helium is why can these have almost infinite Q or you know practically unlimited perhaps perhaps um, is because what you're doing is you're putting a little bit of energy in to compress this uh, to compress a, ca a capsule okay but then this again uses the fact that um, th that fusion reactions go on to heat it further. So in print, so what you can get away with is heating a small amount. Remember, we were talking how how this is deleterious for helium because they have to heat. They perhaps have to heat, um, you know, say uh, uh, like they they have to heat all of it to some temperature, but then only some of it will react. Well, here the good thing is that they um, they do have a collisional regime. Guy that was spamming me. Um, they do have a collisional regime here, and they use the um, the helium energy that for, they do DT, and they do the, use the helium energy to heat themselves further. So they can, you know, you heat a little bit. It's like you're lighting a fire. It is ignition, right? You lighting a fire, and then it heats it further and itself heats. So in principle, you can get very high uh, Qs, like uh, you know, physics Qs. I.e., you can get way more fusion energy out of a small amount of uh, laser beam energy because, uh, you know, the fusion uh, energy that's being released uh, as charged particles is heating the plasma further. So, you, you know, and potentially that growth could be infinite. Now, is that, that going to make sense? That makes sense. I mean, you know, <laughs> again. I, I want, obviously. But I want to ask a question, and I know this isn't, I mean, obviously, we're, we're, this is two and a half hours. Probably, great, lovely. Um, and a Q of 25 is brilliant. Obviously, they, they had a Q of, of uh, 1.5, a Q plasma, that's what we're calling it, uh, of 1.5. 25 is a significant step more. I would say the the current diagram that you've, you've, you've produced there, right, is probably quite bad. And that's where the Q is 25, just from a, from a sort of a finger in the air economical mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, if you put twenty, if you put twenty units of energy in and only get fifty percent more out, you, you know, okay. oh, there's an awful lot of infrastructure mm -hmm. there. What's okay. the level of Q that you need to to mm -hmm. produce significant amounts of energy? So, two points. I may have just yeah. as, as as you were talking, you talked just a little too long because I was going to answer your first point. Okay, yeah. So this looks like a huge step. And so now again, again, absolutely, what everything that I said, I'm actually uh, so actually was super duper critical of uh, inertial fusion, and I've sort of mellowed out on it. But absolutely everything I said, you know, I, you know, this is the kind of diagram that you know that the f inertial fusion people draw, right? Or even a better, more optimistic one than this is that they have to draw, right? They th again, I'm I'm mostly what I'm saying is scientific orthodoxy. So 10% efficiency is what they're aiming for, design points, etc. I'm not making this up. This isn't my garage. This is what and and they have achieved it to be fair, right? But for smaller lasers, like I said, um, but this is the kind of this is what they themselves would come up with. Right um, uh, now, and so and so, absolutely. Well, everything I said about heat, you know, yeah, the burden of proofs on them. You know, they could find that when they, you know, trying to get to Q twenty five, they could find a Q five. There's some big problem, big instabilities they haven't looked at. You know, and basically, I can't disprove anything. The ball, the ball is definitely in their court for them to do stuff. And if it doesn't work, tough luck. You know, um, right. So I'm I'm just as critical as them. If you think you thought I was being mean to Helian specifically, but let me give a uh, let, let me be positive about these guys now for a second. So they gave 1.5. You saw it, right? Um, now, firstly, uh, again, blame them. Um, they thought they were going to get that within optimistically a year after they opened and re and I do the I do the receipts you know I show the receipts for this th line of thinking in the video itself they thought a year optimistically but by 3 years after building the facility you know once the facility is built 
one year, up to even realistically, because they called it the ignition campaign. So what they've just done is, ign is ignition, right? It's called the National Ignition Facility. For 10 years, the national, I, I, I was making this joke and then I, I saw that um, this is actually, um, I, I was personally making this joke and then I realized that the Scottish people made this joke ages ago. So um, the, supposedly the, um, in Scotland, the national animal is the unicorn. Uh, so it's on, on my passport, for example, you know, British passport. And the, supposedly the reason that the national animal of Scotland is because, is the unicorn, is because um, England's national animal is, is the lion. And the Scottish said, well, there's no, you know, um, kind of, we, there, there's no unicorns in Scotland either. There's no unicorns in, there's no lions in England and it's their animal. There's no unicorns in Scotland either, right? Kind of dig at the English, right? Now, um, I was joking that, the, sorry, that's an aside, um, but I was joking this was the National Unicorn Facility because for 10 years they didn't get ignition, okay? You know, they didn't get more, what they, their um, definition is more energy out than in, more fusion energy out than in. Um, so for 10 years, it was the National Unicorn Facility. Um, uh, and, and what they expected, and as I say, I showed the receipts, they expected maximum three years, and it took them 10 years. So now, now the facility itself was delayed, but they expected once it's built, tw uh, which was you know, 2010, 2011, once it's built, it'll take uh, the National Ignition Campaign was one year, so the campaign expected to be done in a year. But even you know, even skeptically, after three years, they thought they'd have it. So that being, you know, uh, back in whatever, 2015. And it took until 2023. And even even in my, you know, first Fusion video, I already, uh, by the way, you know, I, um, let me just sort of um, big myself up. I made it in 2021. And I said, and you can, you know, you can read the quotes. Uh, by the way, I should say, all my videos, um, they're designed to be played back. I know I, I speak quickly, uh, intentionally. I, they're designed to be paused, uh, played back, watched multiple times, and I provide uh, user, uh, user sort of supplied by me. Uh, obviously, it won't happen here probably, but um, I provide user supplied uh, subtitles, which should be taken as the definitive um, sort of uh, the definitive transcript of what I say. I know I eat my words or whatever, but you know, you and, and people are lawyering me, oh, you said this or whatever. Th read the kind of transcript, right? Read the, the, the subtitles I provided. That is the definitive what I, you know, I if you misheard me, that's what I said. Um, just an aside again, but, um, and I, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. How much, how big a key do you need? Okay, no, sorry, that, totally, totally sidetracked. Yeah, yeah. So um, read the trans, but um, so I said in 2021 that they recently exceeded, basically they recently achieved ignition. I said that because I was anticipating by the time I got my original video out in 2021 that they would have announced already. Um, and, and in fact, it took them a year longer. So I was prescient and I, you know, sorry to big myself up. Now, that was the very negative. Let me say what I said, which is, uh, you know, I was going to say something positive. So they just got what, Q1.5. But, you know, maybe a year before or whatever, you know what Q they had? They had a Q of like 0 0.125. They had one eighth or something. So in, I mean, you know, maybe a few years, but like, in a sort of few years, they, they got it up by a factor of 10. And before that, they got it back. So it's an exponential growth. So, you know, they they went up a factor of 10. In a, you know, they can go up now another factor of 10 to 15. And then maybe another few. Now, eventually, that will, of course, stop. But it's not inconceivable if they played their cards right and they did well and um, that they'd get Q of, you know, greater than... Um, the Q of 25 even, or even 100. As another thing, so um, this is a very subtle point, but I discuss it in, uh, it's, um, whoops. Um, it is uh, the direct drive versus indirect drive. So because they test nukes, um, what they do, uh, it's actually in the thumbnail here, what they do, the way they test nukes is they use the lasers to generate x-rays first. Um, and then compress the capsule, and that's actually less efficient. If they shot the capsule directly, um, then they would be better. Now, the reason they so the reason it's like that is because that's that's more like a nuke, and they that's their primary mission. And their lasers are sort of very polar, so their lasers don't come in in a perfect sphere. They come in um, 
so if I if I, you'll have to squint to see this, I'm afraid. Um, I'll, otherwise, I'll have to uh, get up the, even the thumbnail or a picture. But the point is, the lasers kind of come in um, not spherically, but from the tops. Uh, actually, yeah. Okay, here. Right. The lasers come in. You can just see here that they come in from the top and bottom. This is to test it like the way a nuke works, more like that. And they use X-rays, so that's less efficient. So probably. Now, again, this will, in practice, this will take time. This won't be instant. This won't happen in a year. But if they built it, or if they built a subsequent machine, or if they, they can sort of finagle NIF to do this, if they went for what's called direct drive, which is, uh, and which is what I'm shoot showing here, um, uh, it, it, if they shot it directly, f spherically from all sides, then probably you'd actually get a big efficiency gain again, or at least a big Q gain. Um, so yeah, okay. So, oh, so someone's so saying they come in. It, so like yeah, let me draw this. I guess so. Right now they, uh, I'll draw it on top of here very briefly. Um, but they so th what they have is a box. They they have a box called a hole round, and they the sphere that spherical capsule in the middle. Um, and there's a hole in here and a hole in here, and so they come in from the top and bottom. Yeah, someone said it's like an X shape. I guess that is like it. But they don't have any lasers in this direction, or very few at least. Um, okay, so um, so th the 50 megajoules is what's given off. If if you have a Q of 25, someone's asking. If you put in two megajoules in laser and you have a Q of 25, by definition, you know you get 50 megajoules of fusion energy out. Um, and so they you know they have a Q of 1.5. I'm saying it's not so inconceivable that they go to 25 or 100. A very optimistic. And won't happen immediately. And if they say it'll happen in a year, it'll probably take 10 years, but doable, impossible. And so then if you have this sort of 100 and the same, the number's the same, then yeah, then it is. Now, the other thing is, of course, in principle, if they do this quickly enough, it doesn't matter. You know, you're getting 10 megajoules. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in efficiency wise, you're turning 20 megajoules into 30. But if, you know, it's it's like uh, right, profit or whatever, you know, uh, yeah, um, so a luxury company probably makes a huge profit on a given, you know, Rolex or whatever. Whereas Walmart, it's about volume. They make a cent, you know, they, they or they make, you know, a few percent profit, but they sell loads of, you know, whatever, pasta, whatever. So if you're getting 10 megajoules every time, you just do it in principle, you could just do it a lot and be getting, you know, a lot of power in general. That brings on Uh, that brings me on to a general, and this is this can uh, this is the point I made. You know, um, you can analyze this um, any any startup and so on that's doing um, sort of uh, pulsed fusion. Uh, just a very simple ma a napkin math you can do. So you for a power plant, you want to make let's say 400 megawatts of fusion energy. That's then going to you know once you put it through turbines and so on, or even if you don't have turbines but you have a really efficient conversion, whatever direct energy, you still want you know of order hundreds of megawatts of power. Uh, and just to make the numbers clear, let's say we have a 400 megawatt power plant. That means uh, that. Uh, Uh, if I'm seeing, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by chat. Ask, uh, uh, please re reform your question in the, the recent question. Yeah, uh, and I'll answer. Um, but anyway, back on this. So 400 megawatts means you're doing 400 megajoules in a second. And if you work this out, this is 100 kilograms of TNT or 16, uh, you know, KV2 shells. Uh, the, the explosive filler for the actual shell, you know, not the propellant or whatever. That's a lot of stuff in a second, okay? Every second you're doing that. So um, now, firstly, okay. So you could do this. Every, you could do a thousand, you know, a ton of TNT ten, every ten uh, um, seconds uh, for the same rate. But a ton of TNT, I think, you know, nothing will like for a pulsed um, uh, machine. Nothing could survive a ton of TNT. In fact, NIF's very large target chamber. I mean, people get sort of, um, you know, put in there on a rope. Uh, it's, it's massive, but even that can only take about, um, I think, uh, the equivalent of, you know, not even this, basically, tens of kilograms, something like that. Um, so um, 
yeah, I think for, is it 40 megajoules, something like that. Um, so my point is this. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to, any sort of pulsed machine is going to want to operate basically at least once a second, probably a 10 times a second. And what's 10 times a second? That's, you know, a, 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 that's in my video, um, is th that is a machine gun, 10 times a second, 600 rounds per minute. Right, so duh, 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 you know, so is everything going to work? Just even forgetting the plasma physics, and this is, a, by the way, this is you know for helium as well. Is everything going to be able to cycle at that rate for days and months on end, which is what a power plant would have to do? Um, yeah. Um, okay. So the, the sorry was the question about why the direct versus indirect drive. So the uh, direct drive would be more efficient uh, if that was the question in the chat, and that's pretty well established. I mean, even I had a again Mionium, who is from NIF. We had a discussion. You know, um, you there know, there was a specific question from uh, DOE um, on Alpha E program from 2018 about the magneto inertial confinement. Yeah, I saw so it. I wasn't sure what the question was asked. Yeah, it's just like, have you seen it? What's your take on it? Maybe, maybe that's a video. For yeah, yeah. Time. So, so to be clear, with the the even by, um, you know, a, a guy at NIF admits the direct drive is is um, you know more efficient. The, and the reason they've done it, yeah, the the indirect drive is the only thing we've done now. That's because our nukes work. So, hopefully that. Um, Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, definitely rewatch this and so on. So, um, you know, if it doesn't make sense, you can you can rewatch it. You know, you can rewind a bit now as well. Um, so what I'm saying is, you know, keep these kind of numbers in mind. You know, so you, can a proposal including inertial fusion work at 10 hertz? It's, it's not that easy. So now let's say you do have a chamber like this. Okay, what you're going to do now. You know, so if you have 0.1 seconds and this chamber is going to be meters in size, that means you're going to be firing just mathematically, right? You want to have one finish before the other starts. You're going to be want, you're going to want to be firing in um, pellets that are doing the reaction. Helium is going to want to be cycling everything. Now, yes, yeah, some things probably can cycle very easily at 10 times a second, but are they going to be able to form a plasma? Are they going to be able to do it and maintain it? Uh, long term, and all these guys again have. Uh, if you back probably two hours ago, uh, neutron embrittlement. They're going to absorb tritium, things like that, into the walls. Um, they're going to degrade. It has to be economical. It has to be you know um, sort of reliable. It has to deliver the power kind of all the time, uh, or you know re reasonably reliably. You can't just be down. Um, uh, oh, yes, here's a good point. So, you know, this kind of point, yeah. So what you could do is have like a six cylinder. So you could have you could have the system. Um, uh, so you could have a system where uh, you have 10 or six or whatever different chambers. And you're, now you're, you can, you know, obviously that means you can do, uh, you know, if it's six chambers, six times less frequently, you can do a pulse, which maybe will help. But then that's very expensive. Building six big chambers, come on. Yeah, but it doesn't really help the problem, to be fair. But just build more. Yeah, yeah but again, is it going to be expensive? Is it going to be better? Yeah. These are questions. Ask these questions, especially when you see a proposal that says, yeah, we're going to, you know, if it's a pulse kind of thing, these are the questions that they must answer. Have we uh, touched on the lattice confinement fusion. No, let's do that. The very beginning. Let's do that. Let me work quickly. I, what I wanted to do was do a bit of meta talk about the channel itself. Please watch this video. Uh, you know, I didn't. Um, uh, I don't know what to say, but I'll say very quickly. Um, you know, I don't like. Uh, I'm not sponsored by anyone, and I. I, I, <laughs> I don't. If you're interested, I. I actually did get an email uh, asking to sponsor me. They said. Uh, uh, Obviously, I was very sarcastic in response. You know, what I, I do this, um, I make this channel, uh, you know, as a hobby. So I'd love it if you watch my videos, but especially watch this one. This is probably my best video. Um, so the firstly, the downsides again, I'll say the, the downsides of this video is it's about astrophysics. I know me included, you know, you probably you want stuff that works. That's like, you know, makes energy here on Earth now profitable, you know, technological but profitable. So. Astrophysics, a little bit more out there, but everything else, 
apart from the fact that it's astrophysical, you'll love. This is about a real technology. This is the first video about this tech, okay, on YouTube. You search Lobster Eye Optics now, you'll get my video because there is nothing else about this. This is a working tech that I worked on. So it's, you know, I'm very well uh, sort of placed to do this. I sent this to a, um, a former colleague that, uh, as a professor who loved it, he used some of the animations in his own talks. Um, so this is about um, a working, a tech that is, it's really new, but it does work. We've proved it. It's going to um, blast off into space. Space is cool. Come on. You know, if you're, like, again, like, like me, yeah, we love stuff here on Earth, but space is pretty cool. It's about nuclear, the, the, what we're observing is about nuclear physics and plasma physics. So if you like nuclear and plasma physics, you like this new tech, space, Watch this, my best video, it, from just from the point of view, you know, whatever people, I'm sure lots of people have on YouTube have complained about helium or about a fusion or whatever. No one has covered lobster eye optics, literally, um, and certainly no one who's worked on them and knows about them and is a techni good technical description. And as with all my non-ranty videos, is pretty damn good, if I may say so. Um, so I must admit, I was skeptical. And uh, no, it is actually quite a good video. I approve. So there you go. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then I also want to do a meta bit, but whatever about my channel. Uh, I guess the, to sum up, uh, you know, if, well, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess just more of the same. If you if you like to please repost my videos, just a smorgasbord of stuff that hopefully, if you're a real big fan, which is probably about 0 0.1 of you statistically uh, existing in the world, you probably know where all this different. Uh, let's say not very good animations, of course, hand drawn stuff, but um, you know where this comes from. I will invite uh, if there are some super duper fans, which I doubt there are, but I will invite, uh, you know, let's say, um, if you want to do a proper, you know, sort of um, fan art of these very basic, uh, you know, Alice, Bob, Charlie that I put together for my computer video and, and have used. Um, uh, you know, I'll invite any super fan. I was going to talk about Discord as well. I did used to have a Discord, but then, you know, people weren't really talking about it. So if, if people really think that uh, really want a Discord about this, then uh, let me know. I don't know. Uh, post stuff to Reddit for me because I put like I posted, let's say the um, OK, people have been enjoying the Interstellar video recently. Um, you know, I posted that got about two upvotes, five down votes or whatever. So People who know more where to post stuff, please post it, spread it, whatever. That's the meta talk. Let's do Lattice Fusion. I actually didn't prepare that, but that was a super chat. So Lattice Fusion, I do go through this in my video called, um, you know, How Fusion Works, part one. I will just bring that up and kind of commentate, uh, give you the cliff notes. Um, but the point is, it won't make energy. Um, it's, you know, this lattice fusion really does have, you know, once you do this sort of, um, oh, I might have to, I have to, might have to meet you. Oh, I'll meet this actually. What? What? Um, that's me talking to myself. There, that's the, um, right. Here's the video. Let's talk about lattice fusion, which is, I believe is at the end. So what you have to do, um, NASA has found this. What you have to do is you have, um, you can sort of, um, make fusion more probable if you have erbium atoms. And then what happens is the electrons around the erbium atoms kind of shield the charge, they claim, of, let's say, deuterium uh, atoms. Uh, and so it makes fusion more likely. It, it, so now, that if this could be done in a thermonuclear way, this would push up those uh, reactivities uh, of DD fusion. Um, uh, however, to do this, you first have to get, um, or the way they found to do it, I mean, first you can't do this thermonuclear, because once you make this a plasma, you know, you can forget about this beautiful uh, erbium lattice that's shielding the, um, the charge, so that won't work. Um, so you have to do it in solid. In solid. I go on to why thermony. I, I wanted to talk about this, but we really don't have time. That's probably another two hours. So I, I mean, if anyone wants to do another q and I wasn't actually going to do it. I thought we'd do this and then not do it, but maybe we could. Again, um, post if you really want it. Um, if you really want another Q&A, and we will go into it. But uh, talking about why, for example, you have to have thermonuclear fusion and more on that. Anyway, energetically, this will never work because what you need is you need 2.5 MeV gammas. 
to make those you uh, it's very inefficient to make 2.5 MeVs of gammas you'll have to have you know many many MeVs of particle uh, of energy in a particle beam and then to make many many MeVs in, of particle beams you need even more MeVs of actual you know electrical energy so the uh, kind of as a Q uh, it will never work because you've got things that are really inefficient and you cannot again you can't really cheat out gamma rays with any sort of magic um, so I go more into this in the video hopefully that was um, a very brief overview but just but just watch it the um, how fusion works one uh, and also uh, I mean I guess I should say this in a general way I do answer questions that are meaningful I answer questions that are positive and negative so a lot of those you know you as a idiot 15 year old well that brought one I probably didn't answer but ones that I think are in good faith but are wrong I will still try and answer and things like that so so for example if you asked me um, if, you, if you watch the video for example but didn't get all the points I'm happy to answer generally if I think it's in good faith if you spam uh, me uh, you know with a million comments then I won't answer if you're he, if you're so offended that he that I said something bad about helium then you will that you will spam me then I probably won't answer you <clears throat> this has been that has fantastic been speaking speaking very quickly well did i have any more uh, okay let's do ai let's do ai then i really have to go um oh. <laughs> so this was a brilliant exchange so uh, i mean i just really uh, i thought my uh, you know I'm bigging myself up here. I thought my answer was pretty good. Uh, yes. Um, but I thought this was a good exchange. So uh, this is a really good and, you know, not like a hype or anything question, but, you know, what can we use AI for in fusion? I guess I'm sort of putting words in the question as my ask, but generally speaking, what can we use in AI? And it's a sensible question. It's not like the kind of comments I get, oh, yeah, but AI is going to fix it. All this stuff that you've just said, AI is going to just magically fix it. Of course it won't. So my response is, what can AI be used for? And there's a, you know, it was a good question like, okay, specifically, right, what can we train a neural network? What can we train reinforced learning um, to, to do, to actually um, do, okay? Um, uh, and so, so I have several answers. Now, there are some applications. So, for uh, for I, I gave examples. So, for example, for tokamaks, you can you can sort of design the shape of the tokamak. Um, for inertial fusion, you can design the shape of the pellets with AI. You know, you sort of train it. These are good. These are bad, and then it will come up with new ones for you. So that's that's pretty neat. But it's not a silver bullet. I'm you know I really want to st stress that there is the AI is not a silver bullet for several reasons. First of all, um, and I want everyone to just grasp this: AI is not the solution to every possible problem. Okay, and is certainly not the most optimal. Right? If I want to calculate Newton's laws. Uh, you know, if I want to calculate the square root of a number, even something as simple as that, you know, there are algorithms for it. You don't need AI. You don't need a neural net. You just, you know, you want to calculate what's the uh, force of gravity on Jupiter. You plug it into an equation. Yeah, now, okay, if you want to do an orbit around Jupiter or some orbit with Burns, it's more complicated, but it's you solve equations, right? Uh, and there's other, and, and in general, there are other, you know, things like sorting numbers. Again, there's an, uh, there's algorithms for sorting numbers uh, for doing other computational things. So AI, you know, and you'll hear a lot about how a lot of VC-funded companies that are going, yeah, we'll so solve this with AI magically. But AI is not a magic silver bullet. There are, in, you know, and objectively, there are things that are just done better without it. Uh, with with co you know the computational problems that are done better without it. That's one point. Another point um, is again, this is a more general point. Um, you know, we already have intelligence, right? It, okay, so let's say they make a self-driving car. That's great, but that but we already have. You know, we can already drive cars. Humans, right? Natural intelligence. I don't know what they they'd call you know, but the opposite of artificial intelligence. We already have smart humans, and AI isn't going to magically find a solution to a problem that smart, intelligent people who have been talking and debating um, uh, haven't come up with necessarily. Maybe it will, you know, if it's like an optimize the shape of something, maybe it will, but conceptually, you know, humans aren't that stupid. Uh, you know, we, smart humans have thought of, of solutions, and AI isn't just going to magically come along and even if it's theoretically high IQ or whatever, 
it's not going to magically solve that. And finally, um, for Fusion specifically, um, there's a limit to how quickly AI can react to stuff in the um, in the uh, and also and it needs to sense stuff. So in Helion, objectively speaking, it's too fast to be able to sense and then feedback and do something about it. Even if they, so none of those things are possible in something as fast as Helion. Um, but the uh, even if the first two were, if the sensing and reacting were possible in time, probably the the AI also takes time to process. So. Um, um, so. Fine, fine, Mr. E.M. Now, uh, again, you have behaved yourself. Um, if you didn't, uh, the the guy that I accused of spamming, to be fair, okay, you did spam a lot earlier, okay, and I, I did, I, you know, you have behaved yourself. Fair enough. Fine. Um, I'm just seeing chat. Um, the, the, um, I think I think chat has been fantastic. Okay, great. I, 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 do, I disagree with uh, your spamming remarks, uh, generally. Yeah, no, but it's because of earlier. And to be earlier, I had proof. Now, if you dis dis mis misbehave, Mr. Uh, not Mr. No, no, but good. person whose initials are EM, who, let's just say, objectively posted a lot of comments, um, you, know, you did pay some fair. very unfair things. And if you misbehave, you know, we'll, we'll have to litigate through that. But I, I um, <laughs> yes, what did good. I have? Um, so this is, kind of, this is kind of related, I, I, but I really I, have to go soon. So any really final things? Is there any super chats that I haven't responded to? Because this was no, fast. And I'm also think, talking really quickly. So probably people aren't. Yeah. I think this has been brilliant. Um, I think this should be uploaded to YouTube uh, Emorial. Uh, what? For, for all to, all to watch, and, and they will enjoy it. Time Emorial, OK. Yeah, time memorial. Thank you. Oh, and you know, uh, again, you know, just to be conciliatory, like to be fair, the points I raise about Helion this time, okay, maybe rail engineering, the my response, and it was Saki. I'll, I'll just finish with this. So my response was very sarcastic. Whatever. Now, here's a, here's another point. Bef I'd made loads of you know very, and now I do use dry humor and sort of uh, a, a lot in my other videos, but no one had a problem with that. In the response to real engineering, I was sarcastic. It was short. It was fast. It wasn't, you know, I didn't put as many facts in, but it got a lot of views. So, it, you know, it's a bit un it, it, like it's a bit frustrating, I suppose, that if I make a really good video, it doesn't get viewed. If I do reactions, clickbait, whatever, it gets views. But at least it brought you to watch, you know, my um, my other videos, which I thought were quite good. A lot of people found them. Um, and to be conciliatory with Helion, you know, what I said, what I've tried to say are objective points. I could be wrong, prove me wrong, and, you know, I will be your biggest champion. And if you do work, like I say, for example, you know, this is unfortunately a fact, uh, you know, I, again, I was stating facts when I said that there would be a lot of radiation and things would be radioactive and they would be activated and so on. But if you make everything else work, I'll be totally on your side championing saying, look, you know, if the plasma physics and so on works, you know, there won't be long lived radioactive things and just having a bit of tritium or whatever isn't going to be bad. And yes, if you handle stuff well, you won't have the tritium explode. Fair enough. You know, I trust you guys not to blow up any tritium. I'm just saying, you know, that was merely a point saying that it could happen. Don't, you know, and, and uh, I guess on that, it's like, um, part of what I said was that, you know, you have to have it really well regulated. So, you know, yeah, if it's well regulated, and that, which means expensive, which means things will take a long time, but it means you won't get an explosion. If you have a lot of, you know, if you do slapdash and quick and, uh, you know, cutting corners, then that is a potential problem that could happen. You know, it's objectively a problem that could happen. I'm not accusing Helion there. And again, if you answer all these points, I mean, that would also make a great video, by the way, you know, as a response to my point specifically, I obviously did them in paint, I didn't have time to or, you know, to properly represent them. If you want to talk about why I was wrong, great, etc. Uh, by the way, I mean, this is being uploaded to YouTube. So you will be able to watch this afterwards or whatever so that there was a super chat. So thank you. Um, camera. Yeah.
Uh, I love in the ending of this uh, conversation, uh, it, we have ended for the last 15 minutes. So I suggest we... Yeah, yeah, all right. I've got to go because I actually was meant to leave here at uh, this studio in secret yeah. location half an hour ago. So I yeah. will end that there. Thank you very much to Pryor for joining me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for a super chat. Uh, thank you very much to all other super chats for people watching. Uh, see you later.